Good morning to all you guys here and uh, to all of you folks out in uh, virtual land who've uh, tuned in this Saturday morning. Thanks for coming. Um, it's my uh, pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me, um, although this is my own institution, so I guess I kind of invited myself to be here. Um, I have the uh, honor of getting to tell you about what interventional radiology is all about. Um, I've been doing this nonstop since, uh, let's just say, the 90s. Um, and uh, I'll tell you my path, you know, I never thought I'd be a radiologist. I wanted to be a pediatric intensivist. That was my path. Um, when I took a radiology rotation late in my third year, and all of a sudden I kind of had a little bit of an epiphany that the imaging made sense to me. I could sort of visualize it and it really felt natural. And I had a, a, a little bit of a existential sort of moment of trying to decide, am I gonna go down my path of being a pediatric intensivist or am I gonna take a flyer on this whole radiology thing? And um, I went to see my mentor who's a pediatric intensivist. And he said to me, you know, I, I, I sort of laid it out for him and he said, you know, you have to decide whether you wanna be a clinician or a paramedical person, um, which sort of sealed the deal for me. So I went off to radiology thinking diagnostic all the way. And then I did my first IR rotation and I was absolutely hooked. This was like the greatest thing ever because it brought me back to patients in a very intense way. Um, and I haven't looked back since. So interventional radiology, as I just told you, is a very much a clinical specialty. We are based entirely in the notion of being minimally invasive with very targeted treatments uh, and everything is image guided. Uh, what we do involves imaging. We're based in imaging. Um, and so really a lot of it has to do with developing expertise in diagnostic radiology first, and then developing these minimally invasive techniques um, in order to uh, treat different conditions, which we'll talk about very briefly. So um, in order to understand what IR is all about, you know, I tell you first and foremost, Oh, sorry, I don't know, the video has a volume on it, I apologize. Sorry about that. The, um, you know, what is our culture? Uh, first and foremost, I think we're very committed to patient care. Um, the second thing that I think sets IR apart more than other specialties is um, being creative and innovative and solving problems that other specialties maybe can't solve. That's not to say that other specialties aren't really creative and aren't really innovative, but it's very much in the sort of lifeblood of IR. You have to understand that interventional radiology is relatively a, a, a young specialty. We've not been around that long. And yet, if you look at the arc of interventional radiology uh, and how it's viewed in modern medicine, um, I think we've really made an incredible impact in a very short time. As I said, we're pretty highly technical uh, and we do everything image guided. Uh, and so it requires that ability to um, think in three dimensions and to really understand imaging. And finally, you know, what I really love uh, is that we're team oriented. Um, we're a pretty affable group. Um, and, and I think we're very inclusive. And I think if you uh, don't believe me, you should come hang out in IR. That's probably the best advice I can give you is come see what it's really like um, in the Andrew Suite and, and amongst uh, uh, my partners uh, with whom I'm very fortunate to get to practice. Um, so, uh, as I said, you know, it, it really requires um, imaging expertise, the ability to think broadly, um, to understand technology and how we use it, um, to be innovative, and really imaging is about knowing everything about everything. That is the biggest challenge for diagnostic radiologists and why, quite frankly, I think the diagnostic radiology residency is one of the most challenging in that you are expected to know everything about everything. A good example of that is Charles Daughter. Uh, Dr. Daughter uh, was nominated for the Nobel Prize. Um, he was uh, uh, one of those transformational characters. Now, he didn't figure out angiography or how to put a catheter into a blood vessel. What he did figure out was how to use angiography as a treatment methodology. 
uh, and the famous story of how you know he did the first angioplasty. Um, uh, and this was these are images taken uh, from a Life article uh, way back in the days, and and you can see he's actually doing angioplasty here. He's a bit of an animated character. Uh, he was at Oregon Health Sciences, um, an amazing guy by all accounts, um, and his impact on uh, interventional radiology again is is far reaching. He's generally considered the father of IR. I tell you that you know you really should think about interventional radiology if you have some of these characteristics. Namely, you're really interested in taking care of patients and their families. Uh, that commitment is. Um, is absolutely there. I think uh, the mistake people make sometimes is equating us with diagnostic radiology, where maybe there's a little bit more of a physician to physician contact in diagnostic as opposed to interventional, where it's much more patient facing, so to speak. We certainly consult a lot. Our, our, uh, our uh, workflow often involves interaction with other physicians. Um, but first and foremost, we primarily take care of patients and their families. I'd also say if you are. Um, sort of procedurally driven, you're visually oriented. Technically, you like to do things with your hands. You enjoy that kind of workflow. So maybe if you um, really like the idea of surgery, uh, this is like that in the sense that you do things for people, but it's much less invasive. Um, and I'd like to say a little bit more elegant, although my surgery colleagues would argue with me about that. Um, you have to really be comfortable with creativity and thinking differently and not sort of uh, being real protocol driven. Um, oftentimes the problems that face us are problems that seem intractable that nobody else in the hospital can fix. Uh, and on a daily basis, we're faced with these cases. We have to sort of think our way out of it. Uh, and so you really have to enjoy sort of problem solving um, on your feet, you know, thinking very quickly. Um, being innovative, being entrepreneurial, and thinking about opportunities for how to expand our business, which we do all the time, uh, and I think we're pretty good at. And finally, you know, it helps if you're pretty cool under intense situations, uh, because they can be quite intense, whether it's dealing with a patient who's, um, you know, just had a horrible car wreck and is literally bleeding to death, uh, and we have ways of stopping that very quickly. Uh, and so you have to uh, be prepared to kind of be put into that position. I would say, you know, maybe IR isn't a great fit for you if you like the imaging or maybe you don't like the direct patient contact. Um, by the way, all these things, you know, this isn't a value judgment. This is just, you know, we're all different and we're all wired differently. I, I, I think that um, you can be very happy in diagnostic radiology and really not have a lot of direct patient contact if that's what you don't enjoy. Um, you know, if you're going to have a better sense of your identity uh, based on your professional identity, based on an organ system, in other words, you want to be a neurologist or nephrologist or gastroenterologist or orthopedic surgeon, you know, you, you know those labels exist. People understand them. Um, and some people think that way, and that's okay. It's totally fine. Interventional radiology isn't like that because we're so broad into so many different areas. Um, if you like structure and predictability of your, your day, um, IR is generally, most of the time, I would say, you know, five days out of the week, um, you know, if I'm not on call, my days are pretty predictable. But when you're on call, your day gets very unpredictable in the sense that you don't know what kind of stuff is going to come in through the door. Uh, and that's, you know, mortifying to some people and really energizing to others. Uh, and so you have to think about that a little bit. Like, does that get you going? The idea that you don't know what's coming next. Um, it's kind of like Christmas, if you think about it. Um, and then I'd say, you know, if you don't like explaining to your parents uh, or your mom, like I have about 8,000 times, you know, trying to get her to understand what I do, because I'm not a nephrologist, I'm not a neurologist, you know, I, I defy a certain explanation. Uh, and finally, I tell you, you know, if you want to be in the limelight, uh, interventional radiology is probably not for you. A very wise man once told me, you know, the idea of being a diagnostic radiologist, if, if you seek, you know, public attention, um, if you want to be the person at the press conference podium, uh, if you want your name in the newspaper, 
uh, radiology is not for you. And, and I would say the same thing about interventional radiology. You know, you're not going to be that person. These are really good examples of that. Uh, Condoleezza Rice did not have surgery. She had fibroid embolization. It was done by a friend of ours in Washington, D.C. Uh, he's not a surgeon. He's an interventional radiologist. And yet, if you look at the newspaper, they tell you she had surgery. She did not have surgery. And it's a very important distinction. So if this bothers you, like, you know, if this gets you, this really grinds your gears thinking like, oh man, this is a surgery, this is interventional radiology. Like, you know what? Um, it's gonna bother you because that's people lump us into that. They think because we do procedures for surgeons. Um, the uh, vice president, Dick Cheney, way back when, had bilateral popliteal aneurysms fixed. They were done with uh, endovascular stent grafts. It was not performed by Dr. Craig Kent, the chief of vascular surgery. It was done by a couple of interventional radiologists. Uh, same thing here. You know, the first lady had a benign tumor treated on her kidney. It was not done by a urologist. It was done by an interventional radiologist. Again, those people never get mentioned here. They will never be mentioned. Uh, but that doesn't mean they didn't have significant impact. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that we do, and it crosses all kinds of boundaries. And I'll give you a great story of that. So I was in private practice for a period of time, and, and the uh, group that hired me was getting me credentialed at the hospital. This was in 2001. It was 18 years ago. And um, he sent me the form and said, here, check the box of all the stuff you want to do as a you know, this is a small 250 bed hospital. They never had an interventional radiologist before. That's kind of why they hired me. So I went and started checking off boxes of things I wanted to do. I sent the form back. He said, no problem, great. I'll turn it into the hospital credentials committee and um, I'll let you know, you know, it's formality really. And about a month later, he contacts me and he says, hey, we have a problem with credentials. Like what? I you know, I sent you all my stuff. I'm legit. I actually did graduate from medical school. I'm fellowship trained, et cetera. He said, no, no, that's not the problem. It's the what you're asking to do. So what do you mean? He said, well, you checked off the box for aneurysm repair, fibroid embolization, uh, saphenous vein ablation, cryoablation, tumor ablation, chemoembolization, um, you know, varicocele embolization, uh, stroke therapy and uh, a million other things. They said, the credentials committee reviewed this and said, no physician does all of this. So I had to give them all of my cases, my case logs to prove that I could do every single thing that I wanted to do at this hospital. That's interventional radiology, that we can really cross boundaries and no one knows who we are, what we do, but we have such an incredible impact on modern medicine nowadays. So I'll tell you our opportunities are in healthcare reform uh, as value becomes a more and more important term in healthcare. I think interventional radiology is value. That's exactly what we bring uh, within women's health and transplant, the obesity crisis that is out there. Uh, we have some great opportunities to make impact in these areas in very real and uh, measurable ways in orthopedics and treatment of arthritis and in minimally invasive ways as well as treating prostatic hypertrophy with uh, embolization procedures these are done as an outpatient um, and you know there really is growing public awareness so i think those are huge opportunities for us weaknesses you know we fight the perception that somehow we continue to be proceduralists as opposed to clinicians um, other specialties always want to do what we do because we're good at it and it works. Um, there's always the challenge of diagnostic radiology and interventional. You know, there's a bit of a culture shift there, which uh, poses challenges. And finally, the residency match, I think, which others will talk about today, um, I think pose a challenge as well for people who want to go into our specialty. So if you're interested, you know, what do you do now? Well, first and foremost, um, learn more. Test hypothesis, learn about imaging, learn about intervention, come spend time. That's the best, you know, that, that's absolutely the best thing I tell you. At the University of Colorado, I'm proud to say that, you know, anybody can come any, any time. It doesn't have to be through a formal rotation. You just become hang out. Send me an email. Send one of us an email and say, hey, can I come watch what you do? It's like, yeah, 
what size scrubs do you wear? Get you some lead, get in the room, and see what happens. See for yourself, see it up close, um, and, and come check it out. It's really a lot of fun. I think you'll enjoy meeting the people who do it, first and foremost, and I think you'll really love uh, the, care of, uh, the care that we provide to patients um, nowadays. It's, it's pretty mind-blowing. Anyway, um, I've run over. I apologize. Thank you so much, and uh, uh, best of luck, and I'm happy to uh, um, answer any questions later. You can just grab them. All right. Thanks for coming. All right. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Bob, for, for talking about that. So uh, we're going to move on to uh, Dr. Roshan, who's going to talk to you a little bit about IR training pathways, how to get into interventional radiology. Um, and then Bobby. So they're, they're pulled up. There we go. Uh, we'll go over here. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being with us on a taking your Saturday to be with us and also um, those who are uh, tuning in uh, maybe throughout the hemisphere. Uh, we really appreciate and we're really um, excited to talk to you about our specialty and uh, I have the privilege of talking to everyone about the different pathways. How do you get to an IR residency? Dr. Ryu uh, eloquently talked about our specialty as a whole, but how do you get there? And how do you get uh, here? I'm actually the uh, soon to be done uh, fellowship program director. This is the last year that IR will actually have a fellowship. June, uh, July 2020, everything will actually switch over to an IR, just an IR residency. And I will talk to you about the different pathways and residencies that we have. Um, I am the program director for the integrated pathway um, for residency, and Dr. Matt Brown is the program director for the independent. And we'll see him later on today. So I have no disclosures for this. I really want everyone to succeed uh, in your career goals. Love what you do, whatever specialty you actually, um, you decide to go into. Uh, we'll share with you why we went into uh, interventional radiology, why we still do it, what changes that we have coming up, but this is the reason why. So we have two program formats for the, for the IR residency, integrated and independent. Integrated is when you will match for medical school and the entire educational experience is provided throughout the residency. I'll talk about how we split up DR and IR. Independent is kind of similar to the fellowship where residents enter at a later stage in training through diagnostic radiology and are given credit for prior training in another field such as um, DR. And this is not foreign to, uh, for, to medicine. Other specialties have already done this, plastic surgery, thoracic surgery, and vascular surgery. So the integrated residency, residents complete five years of training after a clinical internship year. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So the th first three years of your residency in radiology or DR, and then two IR under an IR um, program director. You match out of medical school or transfer in from your own DR residency. That's a question that's asked, can you transfer from one IR program to another institution, it has to be within the same institution. In terms of the independent program, residents complete two years of training after completing a four-year DR residency. You may enter the uh, second year of the program at the PGY-6 level, provided that you have adequate training, typically at least 12 IR or IR-related rotations, or at least 500 documented interventional-related procedures. In terms of the point of entry, here. We have medical school matching your internship year, and then the next three years, is, it's a three and two. First three years is diagnostic radiology. Our IR residents and IR residents across the United States do the same thing as DR. And I would have to say within our institution, our DR residents do the same thing as all of the IRS. We give them the same training, clinical, procedural, post-procedural management, 
what's indicated, what's not indicated across the board. PGY five and six is whenever there's more specialization in interventional radiology where you will have more IR related rotations as well as more specific um, rotations altogether. It's a little busy, but just follow the highlighted portion. This is our block diagram that we recently used. So everyone highlighted here are the IR residents, also um, uh, ESIR. We have IR rotations that are split up. Everyone at the top are actually uh, fellows. And then these are IR related, ro or excuse me, DR rotations that our IR residents need to still um, accomplish to get the numbers such as in nuclear medicine, breast imaging, in order to be certified and credentialed. And then these are the IR related rotations. Every institution will be different. Uh, we have, we are proud to say that we have a lot of multidisciplinary collaboration throughout all of our specialties in the hospital, particularly vascular medicine, interventional cardiology, um, vascular surgery. Also, uh, we have musculoskeletal. Every single um, resident, no matter what institution you're in, has to do an ICU rotation. That's the only requirement. Every other institution can pretty much make up what other IR-related rotations um, are possible. In terms of the entry point to the independent pathway, again, this is actually through um, similar to fellowship. So whenever you are a third year radiology resident, that is when you will start applying for your independent pathway. You will start interviewing and then during your next, you do one more year in your radiology residency, and then you will go on to your uh, IR um, independent program. It may be at your own institution or it may be other places as well. The independent IR residency is the same process as the IR fellowship. The differences are, right now, there's more awareness. Um, I would ha happy to say that interventional radiology has been, over the last two or three years, the most competitive specialty. We've had a 100% match rate across the United States, but that also bodes some fear to medical students. We've been there as well. Things are pretty much leveling out right now. But I want to say, if you have an interest in interventional radiology or diagnostic radiology, still pursue your passion. There's more interest because of the IR symposia that uh, we're doing across the United States, IR interest groups, along with DR um, interest groups. But again, the perception is more competitive. But that is going to change. We have a lot more spots coming in throughout medical school and a lot more um, positions throughout the uh, independent pathway. This is an extra way that you can, uh, can get into the independent pathway with taking off one year. And this is the ESIR. Whenever you're going to interview at different programs, you want to also inquire about this. This particular pathway designation sits within the diagnostic radiology program, early specialization in IR. And what that says, it gives you a training option so that during that PGY-5 year, your last year in um, diagnostic radiology, you, are the, you have usually the same um, rotations as the junior IR resident. You will still be doing an ICU rotation, still be doing um, more IR um, rotations as well. I would put this in the same bucket as what we used to call the mini fellowships that our residents uh, used to do. It's more of a formalized process, however, and you need to have a certain amount of procedures if you go from ESIR and checked off to only do one IR, um, one year in your independent program. So yes, it's competitive. There are a lot of specialties that are competitive right now, and that's not gonna change. But what can you do? You're here right now, you're staying engaged. Everyone who is tuning in, staying engaged. In IR, as well as DR, it is a critical component to your, our specialty. Every single day we are reviewing images. We still are reading images. It brings a lot of value into our practice. Different practice models are out there, academic and private practice. There are a lot of private practice models that will require you to still read diagnostic radiology. And logistically speaking, that is what brings in a lot of the dollars to support that practice. Interventional radiologists do bring in value because you can bring the clinical aspect into that practice bring in follow-up studies, know what's indicated, what's not indicated. 
And we find that um, training our diagnostic radiologists, residents, who may not want to go into IR, they have an idea of, well, what is indicated, what's not indicated, what they can actually allow, will put in the report and call the referring physicians and say, you know what, this may, you may be interested or you may need to call an IR to discuss what treatment options may be. You don't necessarily need to call vascular surgery or vascular medicine because they have vascular in their name. We also have vascular and interventional radiology. We are also really skilled and trained in vascular medicine. So optimize performance on your standardized exams and rotations. That's just gonna be whatever specialty you go into. Really do well in everything that you do. So this is sometimes what we used to call ourselves, the cowboys, really going out and just doing all those procedures, no matter what they are. So glad you're running to the, um, to, uh, to the cases, that may be the interns, and sometimes they say, well, we do all the magic. It was at one of the graduation ceremonies uh, several years ago, a little intro music to whoever matched in certain specialties, and it was a song that um, pertained to magic. And sometimes that's what we do. We sometimes take care, we, will, we do take care of the sickest of the sick. We take care of patients who are too sick to go into the operating room. That is what I'm on call this weekend. That is what we're gonna do. That's what we do 24 seven. And we enjoy doing that. And this is what it's all about. Really engaging in patients, sitting down. As Dr. Ryu said, we still do it all. We're talking to our patients, following them up in clinic, on the floor, on the wards, doing procedures, reading images, and talking to other physicians. We do have a busy life, but we enjoy every aspect of it and we're never bored. The bread and butter. These are the procedures that I would say, after practicing about 10 years now, I still appreciate these because these are the procedures that may have the largest impact on patients and can have the most serious complications. Do it and do it well. Whenever you're on your rotations, you may have more access to the paracentesis, thoracentesis. Um, you may also have um, biopsies, drainages, central venous access. There are serious complications that can actually happen from these. Know the complications, know what you need to do five steps, and know how to actually um, proceed with um, what can go wrong. As you're moving along through your training and actually as a junior attending, whatever practice you may actually get into, don't overload yourself. You're leading to a specialized, even more specialized practice. Pace yourself, find a mentor, find a sponsor along the way. This is what we believe is, happens in medicine, going to undergrad, medical school, residency, but there's no, really no one way. Um, luckily, in interventional radiology, there are multiple pathways to get there. There are some people who have um, a change in careers. We have had some surgery residents and other specialties decide, you know what? We know about, now I know about radiology. I want to get into it. You're in a, a specific place where you're early in your training, so you have the awareness, you know what's going on. A few take home points for everyone continue to do your best on all rotations and exams, no matter what they are. Show your interest. Every, at, every specialty has some type of connection to interventional radiology and diagnostic radiology. I have to also say that we have a little relationship with psychiatry because we're talking to patients who have had chronic pain, they're depressed. So we have people who we can actually reach out to in terms of taking care of those patients. That's just one um, uh, example that you will not uh, think about all the time. You're being evaluated by everyone on every single rotation, including your patients. Really represent yourself well, as well as your institution. And all in all, do what you love and love what you do. Life is short, you're putting in a lot of energy, you're a lot of sacrifice. Uh, one thing that we want to also um, uh, talk to everyone about is, yes, we are busy in medicine. Yes, we have a lot, a lot of sacrifice taken away from our family, significant others, in terms of the training that we need to do and the practice that we lead, but learn to take care of yourself as well. Wellness is really incorporated throughout all medicine and that's definitely something that we want to instill throughout our specialty too. We look forward to the rest of the day with all of you as Dr. Ryu and Dr. Shram are, will say, 
please reach out to us via email, anything like that. All of you who are actually um, chiming in uh, on Zoom, please email us as well. We're really well connected and we'd love for you to um, actually consider our special. Thank you. Thanks, PJ. Um, so I'm going to start uh, uh, the kind of the next phase of the talks, which is going to be talking a little bit more about what the individual procedures that we do uh, are. So we can kind of talk a little bit about um, each of those uh, uh, kind of areas that we touch, uh, as Dr. Ryu is telling you. Um, it's a, quite a, a, a vast kind of scope of, of practice. So So I'm going to start by talking about uh, interventional radiology for the cancer patient. And I think this is one of the, the largest areas uh, of patient care that we affect um, uh, in the hospital and out of the hospital. So it starts with you know, cancer diagnosis, things like biopsies uh, to diagnose cancer. And then we have a lot of, lot of procedures that we actually do uh, for cancer patients as they go through their treatment. So um, I'll talk to you a little bit about, you know, kind of what we do in interventional radiology, kind of what, you know, indications we have for procedures, and then what, uh, what uh, we can do in the end stage of, of cancer as well for palliative procedures for, for these patients. So this is kind of a, an area of interest of mine is the, the kind of end of life care and what do we do once, uh, once patients are no longer um, candidates for chemotherapy or other aggressive surgical interventions. So what do we do uh, for cancer treatment? So the scope of interventional radiology practice. So we do direct tumor treatment. So um, for patients who have liver centric cancers, we can do uh, either radiation treatment uh, via a transarterial injection. So we go up into the arteries that, that feed the liver. We go out into the arteries that feed tumor and we can actually inject radiation coated beads into the tumor or we can go up and inject uh, chemotherapy directly into the tumor. So we, we do a, uh, we have a, a role in direct tumor treatment. In addition to that, through ablations, uh, we can uh, put in hot needles or, or cold needles, needles that get very, you know, very hot or cold on the end to actually burn or freeze tumors as well. Um, so these provide less invasive options for patients who may be sick and not be able to tolerate uh, aggressive surgical intervention. So not everybody is a good candidate for surgery uh, because the, the risks of that are, are fairly high. Um, for people who have, uh, who have lived with cancer for a long period of time and are, who are starting to get metastatic disease, especially in the spine, uh, we can do uh, different procedures on the spine to control tumors that are causing bony related pain uh, through ablation and through, um, through vertebral augmentation. I'll do a separate little talk about what we do in the MSK realm. Uh, we're masters of pain control. So we do palliative nerve blocks, we do neurolysis, which is permanent ablation of nerves for pain or symptom control. And I'll talk to you about a couple of those pain procedures that we do here in just a second. We can do peripheral nerve blocks for control of site specific symptoms. So if a patient gets a thoracotomy and gets their, you know, gets a, uh, their ribs cut uh, for, um, for a surgeon to go in and, and take out, say, a, a lung tumor, uh, a lot of those patients, as a result of severing that nerve, will get post-thoracotomy pain because they have a little neuroma or a, a stump-related pain there. Uh, we can actually ablate those nerves and alleviate that pain for the long term. Uh, and there are many, many other nerve blocks that we can do uh, for symptom control. Um, towards the end of care, sometimes we can do palliative interventions for patients to relieve uh, other symptoms. So if you have a biliary malignancy and you have a, you know, an obstruction related to, say, cholangiocarcinoma or a, or, a, or a liver malignancy, we can do drainage procedures to try to help alleviate uh, you know, symptoms of cholangitis or, or biliary backup, so itching or, or those sort of symptoms. Um, if you have a urinary tract cancer and you, or a urinary stone and you need uh, relief of obstruction of your kidney, we do those procedures through nephrostomy tubes, uh, nephroureteral stenting, and, uh, and double J stenting. Uh, if you have an obstruction in your abdomen because of you know, visceral cancer and you have a, a bowel obstruction, we can do decompressive gastrostomy or secostomy. We can do cholecystostomy, which is a drainage of the, of the, uh, of the gallbladder in the case of um, 
someone who has cholecystitis but is not a surgical candidate. candidate. Uh, and then we manage fluid uh, in the chest and abdomen too. So people who have malignant ascites or who have malignant pleural effusions, we do thoracentesis, uh, paracentesis, and, um, and long-term drainage catheters for those things. So we do a lot of other procedures for cancer patients as well, uh, from vascular procedures such as palliative stenting, inferior vena cava filters, uh, and their removal, and then things like partial splenic embolization uh, for thrombocytopenia, uh, and then of course biopsy, so which are a, a reasonable uh, degree of what our practice is in the, in the cancer patient. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about non-opiate pain control, which is a, a very um, a hot topic uh, right now. Uh, and the reason being is because, you know, opiates across the country are, are having a, um, are, are basically an epidemic. So this uh, little map that you see on your top uh, right of your screen is a heat map uh, from the Centers for Disease Control uh, about, you know, opiate prescriptions in the United States per 100 persons. And as you can see, in many areas in the Midwest and in the South, uh, opiate prescriptions uh, in 2006, you know, there was more opiate prescriptions per 100, 100 persons than there were actual people. Um, so Colorado does not have as bad of a problem with that. However, this has been a hot area of, of debate because this has led to, you know, opiate overprescription, opiate abuse, uh, and can lead to, um, can lead to long-term problems. So there's about 183,000 uh, deaths related to prescription opiates from 95 to 2015. That's about 46 people per day. Um, so the, the American you know, College of Surgical Oncologists recommends routine pain screening for all cancer patients. If you have cancer, your, your, um, your pain-free normalcy after a diagnosis of cancer is, is pretty low. So you have a, a much higher risk of having a chronic pain condition, which most physicians will just treat with opiate pain medication. But opiates come with consequences. They make you constipated. They make you groggy. Uh, in a patient who is not very active to that baseline, if when you have cancer, this can actually, you know, decrease your level of activity and predispose you to, to other worsening problems like pneumonia and things. So we can do nerve blocks or neurolysis to prevent addiction risk and, and eliminate side effects. So any nerve in the human body can be blocked. It just really depends on whether or not uh, the, uh, the block can be tolerated. So, you know, obviously, uh, if your nerve has motor function, so say something that goes to your hand, you can't block that nerve uh, permanently because that will, will result in, you know, a, a paralysis of the hand. However, if that's a sensory only nerve, those things can be blocked or even ablated uh, to, prov to provide long-term pain control. So you can get about six to 30 hours of analgesia with some of our longer-term agents, uh, and then that can be enough sometimes to break uh, what we call a pain cycle, which is where someone is, is acutely, you know, uh, admitted with a, with a pain crisis. Permanent neurolysis we can do with, um, with phenol, ethanol, or, or radiofrequency ablation. I'll show you an example of that. These are all of the different nerves in the blocks that we can, or, or nerves in the body that we can block or, or, um, or ablate. Uh, there's a, a very common book that I refer people to who uh, want to learn more about nerve blocks or ablation. It has 158 chapters in it. There's 158 different nerves in, in the human body that can be blocked or ablated. These are just a few of those and what we treat. So you can see we treat everything from headache to metastatic uh, related pain uh, to, uh, to low rectal pain. So we can, we can treat basically pain anywhere in the human body through nerve blocks or neurolysis. One of the most common blocks that we do is a celiac nerve block, and that's for anybody who has cancer, you know, basically in the upper half of the abdomen. We can actually uh, block some of the sensory fibers that go to, go to that area, uh, and then we can actually do a permanent nerve ablation, which will help alleviate uh, pain uh, in those patients. So the celiac plexus lives kind of right by the, uh, the celiac artery and superior mesenteric artery, which are the two, uh, two kind of pipes that you see uh, here. Uh, let's see where my laser is. You can see that. I think our laser is dead. Uh, but up, up there, you can kind of see where that is. Um, we use a combination of fluoroscopy and ultrasound to actually put our needle tip exactly where, where we want to go. Uh, so we can do ultrasound guidance uh, on the screen uh, over, to the, uh, over to the left. You'll see that little dark spot right by the uh, arrow pointer there is the aorta. Uh, that little dark spot right uh, in front of that is, um, or, or up on the screen, is the celiac artery. We can actually access that with a needle under continuous ultrasound guidance. We do a little contrast injection, and on screen right, you can see our, 
our needle uh, has injected some contrast. You see it kind of bathing that area around the aorta, and that's where the nerve plexus lives. And that's where we inject, um, you know, alcohol or other medication to um, to ablate the nerve. And that's what it kind of looks like on fluoroscopy when we do that. Um, we can do nerve blocks, you know, or nerve ablation all over the human body. So this is a patient uh, up on screen right that has a, a rib metastasis from pancreatic cancer. He was having eight out of 10 pain uh, in his chest. He was opiate dependent. So he was, he was, um, he was uh, basically having to take uh, oxycodone every four hours to control his pain. He wasn't getting out of bed because he was very loopy from his, um, his opiates. Uh, made, it made him very groggy. Um, I remember this case very well. This guy's um, son uh, looks like, I don't know if you, you guys have ever seen Sons of Anarchy, one of the old TV shows that had like, you know, the, the biker guys. This guy looked like one of the, the biker guys from Sons of Anarchy. What we did is we, we, uh, we put this patient to sleep. These uh, needles that you see on the bottom of the screen are actually ablation needles that are uh, taking care of the nerves uh, that run underneath the ribs. So we ablated the nerves that were causing him pain. And he actually had zero out of 10 pain after the procedure and was able to get off of his opiate pain medication. So this big biker guy who was about 6'4", uh, probably 250 pounds plus, gave me a hug afterwards. So I was uh, pretty nervous at that time because I, I saw him coming at me with some open arms and I didn't know what he was going to do. But he was so happy that his dad was out of pain uh, that he, he gave me a big hug after the procedure. That was a pretty impactful patient that I took care of. We can do, like I said, many different nerves in the body. This is a patient up on screen left. That big bright spot that you see is a, a metastatic focus uh, from colon cancer. You know, we were able to block the nerves in this patient's abdomen to prevent uh, pain that he was having uh, related to that. And then we were actually able to later go in and do a cryoablation where we went in with a cold needle and froze that area of tumor to prevent pain uh, and to control the tumor growth uh, in the long term. One of the other things that we do for cancer patients, as we talked about earlier, is liver-directed therapy. So this is something we can do for hepatocellular carcinoma or liver metastases from different, uh, different cancers. So we, do, uh, we can do either transarterial chemoembolization, where we inject chemotherapy into arteries, or we can do transarterial yttrium therapy, which is, um, which is a therapeutic radiation that we can inject directly into the arteries that go to, to cancer in the liver. Um, so this is just a, a patient example of something that we did um, uh, here at the University of Colorado. This was a guy with uh, liver cancer. He had alcoholic cirrhosis, had a hepatocellular carcinoma, as can happen uh, in patients who have cirrhosis. This uh, on screen, on the bottom of the screen, you can see a tumor in this gentleman's uh, liver. Um, we did uh, a transarterial chemoembolization. So when we do that, we go up into the arteries that feed the liver. You can see here, this is uh, an injection directly into those tumor arteries. You can see that kind of big mass-like area of tumor on screen left. Uh, we mix up uh, some chemotherapy with a special oil that we can see under x-ray. So this is what that looks like to us. The red stuff is doxorubicin. So it's a, it's a very characteristic chemotherapy that shows up very bright red. We mix that with a special oil called the Pyodol. Uh, it's actually poppy seed oil that has um, or uh, has uh, an iodine molecule attached to it. So we mix those two things together and we create this little stuff on the bottom screen right, which looks like kind of red mayonnaise. Um, we inject that into the tumor. Afterwards, you can see it's kind of staining that area of tumor, that bright stuff right there. Uh, and then later, uh, you can see we got pretty good tumor shrinkage and death, that all that dark stuff and bright stuff on the bottom is the shrinkage uh, of the tumor and the dead tumor. That patient actually later went on to surgical resection and got cured of their hepatocellular carcinoma. So we have a critical role in, in, in treatment of these cancer patients to shrink tumors or treat tumors so that they can sometimes go on to more definitive therapy. Same thing here, a 42-year-old lady who had a big breast cancer metastatic focus. Um, we treated her with uh, chemoembolization. You can see how much that tumor shrank over time uh, after, uh, after we did the, the therapy for her. Um, we can treat many areas in the human body. This is a gentleman who had a renal cell carcinoma that was invading into the muscle, into the thigh. We were able to go in uh, through the artery, put in little beads to block blood flow to the tumor. And then on screen right, you see these bright things here are needles that are going into the tumor. That rounded focus that you see around the bright needles there is an ice ball 
these are this is a cryoablation of that tumor and we we're able to actually cure that metastatic focus of tumor and we're able to, to fix that patient's pain we do a lot of procedures for things like visceral obstruction or fluid management um, one of these uh, things that we do is, is biliary drainage as we talked about so this is a patient with cholangiocarcinoma um, these uh, tubular things that you're seeing uh, here on screen uh, uh, in the liver are actually obstructed bile ducts. When someone has bile duct obstruction, they get jaundice, that buildup of bilirubin causes them to be very itchy. Uh, they, can be, they can actually get very sick if their bile duct, ducts are obstructed and they harbor bacteria. It, that causes cholangitis, which is an infection in the bile ducts. So we play a, a key role in management of that through transhepatic biliary drainage. So this is us putting a little needle into the bile ducts, injecting those with contrast. You can see all these tubular things here are dilated bile ducts, and then we can do biliary drainage. So here is a biliary drainage catheter, which actually goes through the bile ducts, drains out the bile, and goes into the bowel, which you can see that little uh, piece of contrast on the bottom screen right is actually bowel that's being filled uh, from the drainage catheter. So we bypass the obstruction and fix the patient's symptoms. Uh, we can do stenting through the bile ducts as well. This is a patient who, uh, instead of getting um, a permanent biliary tube to drain, we actually dropped a metal stent in, uh, and then we're able to later remove that. And that's what that stent looks like when, it, when it's taken out of the human body. A common procedure that we do is, is uh, gastrostomy tubes, and we can do those for feeding or venting. So in cancer patients who have maybe, say, a squamous cell cancer of the, of the neck, uh, that can't eat because they've gotten radiation, they have bad mucositis or, or irritation of the mucosa, they need supplemental nutrition. Uh, many people think, oh, we put a PEG tube in, the GI doctors do that. Well, we actually do the majority of the gastrostomy tubes here at the University of Colorado. We do that through a percutaneous approach. We blow up the stomach with some, uh, with some air. Under fluoroscopy, we poke, uh, poke the stomach uh, with a little needle. We pass a wire into the stomach. We dilate up a tract. And then we actually place a tube directly into the stomach that can be used for feeding or for venting if you have a if you have a uh, an obstruction in the in the uh, in the bowel. That's what that looks like on screen right. You may have seen patients uh, already with gastrostomy tubes um, uh, in your uh, in your time on the wards. Um, we manage effusions and manage fluids in the body uh, as well. So um, this is a patient with a malignant pleural effusion. So. These patients have a cancer that basically weeps fluid into the, either the abdomen or the chest. This can cause problems with bleeding or cause problems, or uh, sorry, not uh, breathing uh, or cause problems in the abdomen from the pressure uh, buildup. When that happens, we can do drainage tubes uh, to, to drain that. One of those is called a Florex catheter, which is a permanent drainage tube. Uh, we place that just like when we do a thoracentesis, we poke a little needle in, we pass a wire, open up that tract, and then we're able to, to install a, a more permanent uh, drainage tube. This is kind of what that looks like. These patients can actually drain their effusions at home, so it gets them out of the hospital because it, relieve, it, it alleviates their symptoms, and then they can actually manage this at home by themselves with this uh, kind of Plurex catheter system. Um, similarly, we can do that for ascites, so fluid buildup in the abdomen. We can also treat through paracentesis um, or the, the, uh, the uh, the uh, permanent catheter-based uh, uh, therapy like the Plurex. So we have a really broad field uh, and we take care of a lot of different, uh, different problems that cancer patients have. And we'll talk to you a little bit about other things that we do. We play a critical role in cancer patients from diagnosis related to biopsy, to treatment uh, from transarterial therapy and ablation, to treatment of uh, symptoms uh, at, the, you know, at, the, at the end of life, including pain, uh, and then and, and refractory fluid buildup. So we have a, a really good multidisciplinary approach. We uh, serve as interventional radiologists uh, on multiple different tumor boards. So we, we serve on a, a pancreas uh, tumor board, a bone metastasis tumor board, a, um, a, a liver cancer tumor board, uh, as well as a colorectal uh, tumor board. So we were actively involved in cancer care. So if cancer care is something that you like to do, but you don't want to be a, a surgeon who takes out the cancer and you don't want to be a, a, uh, a medical oncologist or a radio, radiation oncologist, you can still participate in cancer care in addition to doing many, many other things, which we'll talk to you here about in a little bit uh, in interventional radiology. So 
it's nice that you get to get many, many different flavors of, of patient care and interventional radiology. And as Dr. Ryu and Dr. Roshan had talked about, that's kind of one of the strengths of our specialty is that we really can treat the patient head to toe, many, many different conditions. Uh, we have to know about many, many different things. And, and, and that's just a, a really nice diversity of practice. So um, in my opinion, obviously the best specialty because I chose to do it, but, uh, but uh, the diversity I think is one of the, the major strengths of, the, of what we do. Um, and I think we'll continue on with uh, Dr. Trebetti, who's going to talk about inferior vena cava filters. Um, or is Matt here? Or Matt, yeah, Matt can talk a little bit more about IO uh, therapies. Um, all right, guys, so we're going to continue on with, uh, with uh, Matt Brown. He's one of, uh, one of our partners here in, in IR. And we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about interventional oncologic uh, care. So I talked a little bit about kind of pain procedures and drainage procedures. He's going to talk a little bit more specifically about how we can treat uh, cancer uh, for our patients. All right, thanks, Chris, for having me. Thank you guys for coming out on this very snowy Saturday. Um, so uh, I'm a CU product. I've been here as a resident fellow, and we have a bustling interventional oncology practice so much so that we can sort of talk about it twice. But Shram and I do a lot of the oncology work here, and I think it's a very interesting, very satisfying part of interventional radiology that not a lot of people uh, realize that we do, um, but we play a very pivotal role. And I think it's another example of IRS becoming clinical and sort of uh, dispelling the myths about what some of the older uh, doctors or what people outside of radiology think that we do. So an overview of the problem, cancer is a, is a disease of the 21st century, basically, uh, you know, in 1910, you died of the flu or you died of tuberculosis and you never lived long enough to get cancer. So um, that being said, a lot of the work in this hospital and hospitals across the country is, is related to cancer. Um, and you can see those numbers there that basically, I don't think there's anyone in this room that doesn't have a family member or a cousin or a neighbor or knows someone that's been affected by cancer. And it, it, it percolates throughout the healthcare system these days. And once again, that's because people are living longer. Um, so traditional oncology care has been composed of really these, these three pillars, as people call it. Uh, medical oncology, uh, surgical oncology, and radiation oncology, which was an offshoot of regular radiology many, many years ago. Um, but what we propose here is sort of a fourth pillar, interventional oncology or interventional radiology. Uh, as people have talked about, uh, we are, because modern medicine is so imaging heavy, we're uniquely centered uh, or uniquely positioned to be able to provide minimally invasive treatment, diagnosis, and even guidance. Um, with regards to modern cancer care. And we're involved basically from diagnosis through the therapy through the end stages. Um, as you guys go through your medical career, you'll realize that so much of medical care is boiled down to numbers and how long people are living. But I think IR offers a real advantage in that everything we do is minimally invasive. And that's one of the biggest feedback we get from all our patients that, uh, I can't believe you did that so quickly. I can't believe I was leaving the hospital the same day as compared to, you know, people with their hair falling out or all these complications from surgery. So that's one thing that we have to offer that I think the other surgical or medical specialties don't really have to offer is that a lot of what we do is so, so much less morbid than them. So this is sort of the traditional oncology model, uh, depending on um, you know, when you got diagnosed and what kind of cancer you have, of course, but typically they found it early, uh, like a early breast cancer detected on screening, colon cancer detected on screening, and, and you get a colon surgery or breast surgery, the cancer's out, it's done, you're cured. Um, or it's found in a sort of uncurable or what we call palliative stage where your goal isn't to cure the patient, you can't cure the patient, you're just trying to help them live longer and have, help them have a higher quality of life. By and large, we're involved with number two. Um, but typically, when we're talking about extension of life, we, like I said, part and parcel of that or hand in hand with that is the fact that quality of life is very important. Um, and traditional therapy, including more surgery, uh, radiation, or, or cancer can be, or I'm sorry, uh, chemotherapy can be very morbid. So modern cancer care is really centered around diagnostic radiology. They don't do anything make any therapy decisions pretty much based without diagnostic radiology input. So uh, I've got a pretty cool picture here on the left, which is uh, uh, what we call an FTG PET scan. Uh, and what that is, is you give the patient radioactive glucose that's been uh, made in a cyclotron and it emits positrons and basically it functionally detects 
what's taking up glucose. And cancer is very glucose avid along with the heart uh, and the kidneys and it's excreted there. So basically with this, you can functionally determine what tumor is active, which is a, a, a big thing. You can determine what cancer cells are still alive and whether you need to change the treatment. The other thing that's changed in modern cancer care is it used to be all colon cancers were lumped together. And it turns out, as you guys are learning in the depths of alphabet soup of first and second year to a certain degree, um, there's a lot of mutations and which mutations cancer patients have affects their outcome. It affects the therapies you're given. They even have tests like foundation uh, and Claris where you send a piece of the tissue off and it comes back with a susceptibility report about what chemos may work and what uh, chemos may not work. So in that sense, getting the tissue is often the issue, as they say. Um, basically, no one treats any cancer these days without tissue. Uh, like we talked about, personalized medicine is very important. Uh, what is colon cancer is actually, you know, 100 different diseases based on the mutations, and you're not going to know that without biopsy. Uh, they have things called cancer vaccines now, most notably in prostate cancer, where uh, you do a biopsy. The cells are sent to a company uh, mixed with your blood, and basically they develop a, a, a sort of antigen that you can inject into the patient, and allegedly that may, or it's been shown, I should say, to improve survival and sort of sensitize your own cells against that. But the fundamental point here is you need a biopsy to do that. Uh, and doing an open morbid biopsy on someone who's dying of cancer or it's a palliative case doesn't make a lot of sense. So you can see this pretty cool image here. This was about a five minute case I did uh, where there's a lesion deep in the chest and basically using CT scan guidance, we advance the needle incrementally. The patient's given Lido and only a small amount of narcotic. Uh, they're done, they're off the table, they're going home in an hour. Um, and potentially getting a biopsy, which may further guide their therapy. Uh, so that's a pretty big win for them. I've talked enough crap about other specialties. They have their role, of course, but uh, like everyone else here, I'm a believable in interventional radiology. So treatment that we can provide for cancer VIR is, can potentially be curative if, if the tumor's small. Uh, and it's generally divided into ablative therapies or transarterial therapies. Um, this is one technique called cryoablation. Um, Shran probably talked about this a little bit, but basically these are small needles that uh, circulate very cool gas through the tip and they can burn, uh, they can freeze tumors to death. Potentially people have shown this to be equivalent to partial nephrectomies. Uh, so it's very useful in sort of older morbid patients. Um, and it works pretty much just as well as surgery, but people leave the same day, you can do this under conscious sedation. Likewise, uh, you can do the same thing, but with heat. Uh, microwave destroys the tumor and tissues and people go home the same day, potentially a cure. Um, Shram talked a little bit about this, but you know, the liver is a common site of metastases, so we can inject beads into the tumor to help plug up the blood flow, deliver very high doses of chemotherapy or radiation. Uh, this is a pretty cool picture from a, a right hepatic artery injection. And you can see there that uh, the, all the extra black contrast up top is uh, extra blood flow in the tumor. So when you inject beads loaded with chemotherapy or radiation, it delivers very high doses um, directly into the tumor of whatever substance you put in there. Once again, done the day case with people leaving the same day. Um, palliation, uh, Shram talked a lot about this. I won't spend too much time on this, but people are living longer with cancer. Uh, if I haven't made this point already, it's that quality of life and symptom relief are important. These are some nerve blocks. Patients with pancreatic cancer in particular tend to have a lot of pain related in involvement of the visceral plexus. So in an, in an outpatient 30 minute minimally invasive procedure, you can insert needles and inject absolute alcohol around the nerves to destroy the, uh, destroy the nerve plexus. And we've had people go from taking so many opioids uh, that they don't know what's going on to be in, uh, essentially pain-free on minimal outpatient oral medications. Trim talked about that. So. I spend a lot of time on IO, but that's not true of all my partners. IR is a very big field, a very interesting field, and uh, it's most of what I do, but it's not what every interventional radiologist does. And one of the great things about IR is you can pick a practice and do what you love and treat a lot of, treat one particular disease process, or you can still have a broad-based practice. Um, but IR is pretty much central role in cancer care. It's it's interesting as a radiologist to sit in a tumor board and have a surgeon or a medical oncologist ask you what you want to do. Um, but that's the sort of power of being a, uh, an imaging trained physician and the power of uh, training at an excellent program like this. Thank you guys.
All right, thanks, Matt. Um, so next, uh, Dr. Trivedi, uh, Promo is going to uh, come up and talk to you a little bit about um, IBC filters and filter retrieval, which is uh, a key role that we play for patients who have uh, basically uh, DBT who cannot be anticoagulated. So, um, let's see here. We actually can't get out of this. <laughs> There's no, uh, oops, we're moving a mouse here, but we can't. Oh, oh, just gonna just the oh I got you, got you, got you. Sorry, Sorry I didn't realize this was functioning too. Okay, so we, uh, and then you have your, Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> uh, I'm Pramil Trivedi. Thank you for spending your Saturday with us. Um, I want to start by saying this is, um, you know, credits where uh, credit where credits due. Um, much of this was uh, put together by John Lindquist, who's one of our resident filter experts. Um, but I do particularly enjoy talking about IBC filters, and I think for today's session, it um, highlights a few things that are, I think are important takeaways. So. Um, IVC filtration, um, this, this concept applies to whatever you do. You're going to see patients who need this treatment um, or have an IVC filter. And, you, and regardless of what specialty you go into, uh, this will be relevant. Um, so uh, from a patient population standpoint, this is a fast impact. Um, but also, I think it's interesting because it highlights the spirit of innovation that's central to IR. But also over time, as you'll learn, um, it's a good lesson in um, responsible stewardship of technology as it gets disseminated. You know, good ideas spread quickly, and it's going to be up to us doctors, um, care providers, to be responsible as far as which patient gets what treatment and to be longitudinally invested in these patients to understand are we doing good for them. So before we start with the Treatment, let's start with the problems. So DVT, deep venous thrombosis, is um, uh, blood clots in your legs, to put it simply. Um, and it's specifically involving the deep veins. So what are the deep veins? It's sort of your highway system for getting blood back from the legs back to your heart. And uh, it's the iliac veins, femoral veins, um, posterior tibial veins. And if, you, if the highway gets plugged up, there's blood clot in, in the deep veins, it manifests clinically with swelling and redness and pain. So this is really how the clinical examination starts. You're gonna see asymmetric swelling, redness, tenderness in one of the extremities. Classic presentation. You get an ultrasound, you find, okay, there's a blood clot. Here's a little bit of an anatomic overview. Um, you have your tibial, popliteal vein, femoral vein, iliac vein. It's really, this is the highway I'm describing. You also have a superficial drainage system, uh, the um, saphenous system, and that's not what we're talking about. You know, those, those are tributaries that drain more of the superficial leg, and they eventually dump into the deep system, but the deep system is your central highway. And clots in the deep system tend to propagate much more quickly and have more consequence. So what can happen with these clots? You can get a PE. I think most of you are familiar with, with the concept of a PE. It's blood clot that's traveled to the lungs. It can cause heart strain. Now you're obstructing flow coming out of the right heart into the lungs. And in really severe cases, it can uh, result in significant morbidity or mortality. It's a very common problem. You know, over 300,000 cases per year. I'll let that sink in. That's a massive problem. And it's you know, third most common cardiovascular illness behind um, MI and stroke. This is what PE looks like. Um, what you see here is a CT scan with contrast in the pulmonary artery. And the red arrows indicate a clot in the pulmonary artery. You can imagine as blood is trying to flow through this large amount of clot, it can have a lot of trouble. There's secondary consequence for the heart trying to pump across this clot. 
So we want to avoid the situation as much as possible. What are some therapeutic options? If you look historically, well, the first thing that people started doing was just ligating the IVC. You know, just put a suture across the IVC, clot can get to the heart. We got a slight, you know, got a bit more sophisticated. We started um, clipping the IVC. This was done surgically, of course. And uh, same concept, you just, there's no IVC left. So how can clot propagate? Um, and then we got into this era of filtration. This is the first filter, um, the Mobin Newton filter. And then, you know, the one that most people know is a Greenfield filter. Uh, it's important to note, you know, kind of the, the state of innovation at the time, you know, they tested it in 24 dogs and it was approved for human use. So um, the burden of proof was fairly low when this got approved. And this is what it looked like. And it was inspired by um, the oil industry. So uh, the filter design is very much what was uh, used in oil pipelines to prevent sludge from propagating and altering the flow dynamics of oil. And you can imagine how this pipe, this oil pipe kind of looks like an IVC. Here's your filter. And instead of straining oil, we're, we're straining blood. It makes some conceptual sense, of course. Uh, a lot of innovation in IR starts that way, makes some conceptual sense. And then let's see how it pans out. And we tend to deploy it right below the renal veins uh, to catch clot coming from either leg or the deep pelvis. So when would you use this technology? It makes some intuitive sense. Uh, of course, the 300,000 patients who get a PE shouldn't get, that's too many filters, right? That's not, it's not an appropriate use. So when would you use um, IBC filtration? Well, if there's a problem with first line treatment, which is blood thinners. So if there's either contraindication, so an example would be someone has a brain metastasis that's, that's prone to hemorrhage. If you put them on blood thinners, they could get intracranial hemorrhage, not a good thing or someone you put them on anticoagulation and they suddenly start having a bleed that's significant, like a GI bleed. You see that often in sick patients. Can't leave them on anticoagulation. You gotta do something about that. Um, massive PE. Now massive is not just clot burden, right? So you can, you can have a large amount of clot in the pulmonary arteries, but not have it be physiologically significant. But if there's consequence to the heart or the lungs, that's massive in the sense that if you cannot, if the patient cannot maintain their blood pressure, that's a massive PE. Any more PE could be potentially life-threatening. So in that case, even if they can tolerate anticoagulation, it's appropriate to consider filtration. And then there's this version of the same concept, which is some patients get a little bit of clot thrown into their lungs over and over and over again, to the point where their lungs are really hurting, there's hardly any reserve, and you want to protect them from even having little bits of clot going back to the lungs because it could, that could be enough to cause respiratory or cardiac failure. There's few less um, well-proven indications, but these are also reasonable. I'll just sort of mention a few, you know, in the setting of se severe trauma where the patient, you know, they're coagulopathic, they're much more likely to form DVT, they cannot be anticoagulated, makes sense to do filtration or someone's on blood thinners, but they need surgery and for a little bit of time, they can't be on that blood thinner, again, filtration. Conceptually, I think you're starting to get what patients need this. There are lots of different types of filters. We won't go through all of them, but you'll, if you see the types of filters listed, you see most of them still retain that original conical design. It works pretty well. Um, in terms of broad categories, they're permanent, retrievable, convertible, bioabsorbable. That's the latest category. Um, Retrievable filters, as of the early 2000s, are FDA approved to be left in forever. And uh, there are some consequences to that. So I say retrievable uh, with the explicit clarification that you can leave them in long-term. So um, when would you use a permanent filter? It's uh, patients who are immobile, have a terminal diagnosis, advanced age, poor health, patients who are not likely to come back to you. <clears throat> what is the advantage of putting in a permanent filter? Well, they're structurally a little bit more sturdy. So they're less likely to break off or have any other complications traditionally associated with retrieval filters. And you'll hear a little bit more about that in a second. Retrievable filters, when, you know, any transient indication, when we expect that a patient could potentially go back on anticoagulation or whatever threat that you're trying to guard against, it's transient, you put in a retrievable filter, take it out as soon as possible. 
And here are different types of filters. You'll see that you know they, they can have different designs, but the bottom line is they're built so that they can be collapsed and they have a hook that you can engage to remove them. Here's an example of how you would retrieve a filter. So you put in a sheath, here comes a loop snare, it's a lasso, advance it over to the filter apex, grab that hook, and, uh, and cover it up with a sheath. Okay. That's how we retrieve it. Convertible filters are relatively new. The idea is, you know, if you're not sure whether they're gonna need a permanent filter, uh, they're the, you know, you put, put these in and they're structurally a little bit stronger than retrievable filters. And the way you uh, convert them or make them permanent is you grab the hook, the hook comes off, all the tines separate and they become a stent. This time gets incorporated into IVC and it's, you know, over time it's like nothing was there to a degree, right? Um, in general, there are consequences to any medical treatment and IVC filters are no exception. Um, a common issue is penetration of these legs. They're built to flare out with the conical design. The legs end up coming out of the IVC and penetrate adjacent structures. That's very common. Usually that's a low consequence. Occasionally it can cause pain. Um, they can migrate. These legs can break off. And very commonly, they can cause a DVT. That's a little bit counter counterintuitive, right? We're trying to prevent blood clots from going up and that increases the risk of blood clot. But generally, the blood clots tend to be below the IVC, so the clots still are protected from traveling to the lungs, which is the whole point of IVC filtration. And it brings up the important notion that while they're helpful, while the patient has no other safety from PE, it's nice to have them there. As soon as the blood, the blood thinners are on board, the filters are only exposing the patient to risks that you don't see any benefit for. So here are some examples of what can happen with these filters. These legs can break off. So here's, you know, in the white areas, you can see a leg that's just floating probably out in the retroperitoneum. Um, here, here's a contrast injection of the IVC. So the dark stuff is contrast. You see the filter, and then you see those filling defects, the white stuff below the filter, that's, that's clot. And that's very much an example of what I was talking about. And it's also tilted. Um, and here's a, a CT example of how these struts can go out of the IVC. So the white arrow indicates a leg that's sitting outside the IVC. In fact, all, all four of the major legs are sitting out of the IVC. We see that, again, not infrequently. In this case, it's actually penetrated into the adjacent aorta, into bowel in this example. And where is this filter sitting? in the heart. So, so that can happen rarely. It's not a good situation. Um, with increasing use, complications built up. Um, and we, uh, as a society, recognize that these are not benign treatments. And there's an increasing recognition now that uh, IVC filters are associated with complications. And the legal industry certainly jumped on this opportunity from a litigative standpoint. And um, there was a lot of mass marketing. You know, if you have an IVC filter and if, you, if you've had any of these complications, please contact a lawyer. There's a whole secondary meta industry around patients who had complications of IVC filtration. So how did this happen? How do we get here? And as you know, if you go back historically, this was a good thing. Filters worked, they saved lives. We put them in in too many patients and we didn't get them out, right? So they worked for a specific time period for a specific population. And then their, the standard indica indication creep happened. The treatment became a liability when the wrong patients were getting it for too long. So the current FDA recommendations are, look, get them out as soon as possible. When the patient doesn't need it, get the filter out, which means the onus of responsibility lies on the physician who's putting in the filter, but also as a community, we need to recognize this problem. When you see a patient who has a filter and is on anticoagulation, call your IR doctor. Refer the patient to us, we will examine them, we will see if they should get their filter out. So most retrievals are relatively straightforward and are very low risk. If the filter is sitting straight up in the IVC, no big deal. 
The difficult retrievals happen when the filter is tilted. So the hook is now sitting, it's incorporated, it's sitting outside the wall on some occasions. Um, the, the angle of the filter is sort of sideways. There's filter fracture, long dwell times where the entire filter is, is um, endothelialized, so there's scar tissue, right? So you can't get to the filter because there's scar tissue in the way. Um, or there's a lot of thrombus in the filter preventing collapse. These are all associated with difficult retrieval. We can still do it. Advanced retrieval methods are very successful in um, centers with a lot of experience like this one. So this is where centers get separated. The, the folks that do it a lot can do it successfully. The, the folks that are doing it intermittently, understandably, not as much success. So this is where referring a patient to a, a center that has some experience with advanced retrievals is very important. There are lots of retrieval methods, but the, the couple I'll focus on are forceps and laser, and just to give you a sense of how these work. Um, a sheath is put in instead of a loop snare, we advance a, a forcep, um, we engage the filter and then start doing blood and dissection of the scar around the filter. Ultimately, the scar tissue falls away with enough persistence, grab the filter, put in the sheath. It's a little simple, but that's basically the concept. Um, here's an example, tilted filter, grabbed it with a hook, grabbed it with the forceps and then sheathed it. <sighs> Laser, when, the, when does that come into play? This is a good example. Here's a filter and all the yellow, the, the tissue around the legs, that scar tissue preventing the filter from coming out. Um, the hook is engaged, but as you come down with the sheath, you will see this frequently, the IVC wall effect effectively comes with the filter and it doesn't release the filter, okay? And uh, this scenario in C can be pretty bad, consequential, because the, you're occlusive of blood flow. So the heart needs blood from the IVC and now, you know, there's no blood going through. And by the way, you're not getting the filter. So this is where a, sh a laser sheath can be very helpful. It's exactly what you would imagine. It's a sheath with laser. The laser cuts through scar tissue, releases the filter. There you have it. And it allows you to take the filter out with little consequence for the wall itself. Um, permanent filters can be retrieved. This is a common misconception out there. We can retrieve them. We just have different techniques to grab them and get them out. And if all else fails, we can always crush the stent and uh, crush the filter and put a stent through it. Major complications, despite all of this sounding a little bit heroic, are very rare. So even, even if we have to do complicated advanced filter retrieval, uh, the rate of complications is very low. The common thing that happens is a little bit of bleeding associated with the IVC, um, and in the long term, a little bit of clot propagating back into the heart. So it's absolutely appropriate to refer these patients to IR for evaluation. It's never a bad idea. So in conclusion, um, filters are very useful in preventing PVP. They save lives in the right patients. It's very important to be focused on who those patients are, to be accountable to them, and be good stewards of good technology. Thanks for your time. Um, Thanks, Primal. Uh, so you guys are going to get a hands-on workshop here in just a little bit, and we're actually going to be doing filter deployment and retrieval upstairs to use live x-ray to uh, to put these things in and take these things out here in just a little bit. Um, the other One of the other stations that we're going to do is a vertebroplasty station, which I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, now, um, about what we can do sort of in the bone space. So we've talked a lot about, um, about uh, you know, kind of cancer therapy. Uh, but we're also going to talk to to you guys about what we can do in the in the musculoskeletal space to uh, to help out with pain or or stabilization. <clears throat> so um, I'm just going to talk to you guys about uh, interventional therapy for musculoskeletal malignancies or uh, or osteoporosis. Uh, so just a brief thanks. This is one of my mentors in the MSK space, Sean Tutton at the Medical College of uh, Wisconsin. So uh, when uh, someone has osteoporosis or cancer in the spine, it kind of weakens the weakens the bone. So the osteoporosis obviously is a demineralization process which will weaken the crosslinks in bone. 
Um, cancer, when it gets into bone, typically uh, you know creates a, a lytic lesion, which kind of uh, eats into the, the uh, either the cortex or the uh, or the medullary space, which uh, which has some of the the uh, crossing uh, stabilizing factors of the bone. So, in addition to that, uh, as uh, cancer expands, it can actually cause kind of pressure related pain relating to um, to uh, increased pressure within the bony space. Uh, and we can have several different ways to treat that. Um, these are all minimally invasive options when it, when it uh, compares to traditional orthopedic surgery. So um, I don't know if any of you guys have gone through your ortho rotation yet, but you know that's a, a space where they use a lot of hammers, drills, those sorts of things. We do kind of the same thing, but we can do it via a percutaneous approach. I'll show you some of those things. Cancer-related fractures are pretty common. So uh, in addition to, um, to the actual cancer that can kind of eat up the bone, uh, uh, patients who have had chemotherapy uh, or have had poor nutrition because they, you know, have uh, have cancer and are otherwise losing weight or are unable to keep their weight weight up. Um, these patients have a, a pretty high incidence of, of either osteoporotic uh, compression fractures or um, pathologic compression fractures from a, from a malignancy. So um, all of these chemotherapies induce kind of a hypogonadal state, which actually predisposes them to to actually lose uh, bone mineral density at a faster rate. Uh, than uh, than the average uh, person. So uh, this is kind of what a vertebral compression fracture looks like. So the uh, the vertebral bodies are obviously like the the blocks that keep the the spine upright and stable. Um, when uh, someone has osteoporosis or a weakening of the bone uh, because of loss of uh, mineral density, or if they have a, a, a cancer in the bone, what can happen is that bone can collapse essentially. Uh, so that bone. Um, will collapse and that, that collapse causes pain. And we can see that on an MRI as this kind of low signal uh, density that you're seeing here uh, in the L2 vertebral body on the T1 weighted image on the left. On the right, you see some that bright streak going through the bone there uh, at L2. And again, unfortunately laser point is not working, but, um, but that bright streak right there is actually a crack in the bones where the bone is collapsed and it actually has a crack down the middle of it. Um, so what are the consequences of, of these vertebral compression fractures? Actually, these things hurt really badly. Uh, you picture an older person who is not very mobile at baseline, and then you, you have a broken bone in your back that's, that's not able to be fixed uh, through conventional methods. It's, these patients decondition. They lay in bed. They take pain medication. Uh, they're not up and moving around, so they get weaker. Uh, the classic uh, treatment of a vertebral compression fracture is to put people in a TSLO brace, which is like a picture, uh, uh, like a, a police vest, you know, a Kevlar vest that a policeman wears, except it's got a, it's all made of hard plastic. Uh, so imagine wearing one of those 24 hours a day, you know, not only is it uncomfortable, but it also, you know, um, also, you know, pretty poorly uh, compliant. Patients tend to not like them very much and, and not wear them. So, all of these things are predisposed to kind of a loss of independence for the patient. So they're in bed, they're not moving, they're in a lot of pain, they have this very stiff brace on, so they can't really take care of themselves quite as well. Um, they sometimes lose weight, uh, you know, loss of, uh, of, you know, or depression, all those sorts of things kind of follow suit when someone has a chronic pain condition. So there's many different things that, that happen when you, someone gets a vertebral compression fracture, and these are all the different things. You, get, you can have chronic pain, you have an increased future fracture risk, um, you have uh, excess mortality, and that's related to development of things like DVT or pneumonia from not being up and moving around very much. Um, and these patients, obviously, you know, if the, you have multiple vertebral compression fractures that are causing a really bad kyphosis or kind of hunchback uh, appearance, that can actually impair gait and predispose to even more compression fractures. So those are some of the technical things that happen. So when we have someone with cancer or someone with an osteoporotic compression fracture, you know, our therapy for them is, again is multidisciplinary. So we collaborate with many different doctors in the hospital. Obviously, a lot of these patients are older; they're fairly sick. Um, they have uh, may have cancer, so they're not great surgical candidates. So they're not a good person to go to the operating room uh, to uh, to get you know some sort of uh, some sort of open vertebral stabilization. So that's where we come in. So. We, you know, can prescribe symptomatic relief, so the pain medications and bed rest, but we, um, we also do things like vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty, which is what, what we're talking about uh, here. So vertebral augmentation, essentially we can do that for any patient with a painful compression fracture that 
that is failing basically the, a little bit of bracing and, and pain medication. If you have pain more than two weeks uh, as a result of a compression fracture actually indicated for treatment, uh, or if they're hurting so bad that they come into the ER for pain medication. So those patients are also indicated uh, for, for treatment. Lastly, and, and kind of more importantly, if someone is older, you know, like, like most patients with osteoporosis, um, if they take opiate pain medication, they may kind of unmask some in some underlying you know, mild dementia uh, and make those things worse. So if they're failing or have complications related to narcotics like, uh, like confusion or if they're, uh, if they're having complications related to mental state, those things can, um, can be an indication to do a vertebroplasty. So vertebral augmentation, outpatient, it's minimally invasive. We can get this done in about an hour or so. Uh, patient stays with us for about two hours of recovery. That's about how long it takes for our cement to, to set. Um, occasionally, you know, we can do this with general anesthesia, but more often than not, we give them a little bit of IV narcotic and a little bit of sedative, and we can get, get them through the procedure. Um, so what we do is we go in through the back, we go into the vertebral body itself, and we inject cement into the vertebral body. And we have actually uh, uh, some, uh, some kind of uh, uh, sawdust spines upstairs of where you're going to get to do this a little bit later today. So that, um, that cement actually immobilizes the fracture so that it keeps the fracture from moving. So that, that uh, alleviates pain. And then it relieves stress on the remaining bone by providing a, a little bit of more strength of the bone. So this is a patient that we had um, that had a breast cancer and had multiple vertebral compression fractures. So you can see how she's starting to kind of hunch over a little bit as a result of the, the compression deformities. And you can see all of these different little dark spots in the bone are areas of, uh, of cancer as well. So you can see up in the thora thoracic spine, up near the, near the mid thoracic spine, she has a pretty bad compression fracture, and then multiple of the other vertebral bodies are sort of taking this bow tie look where they're having central compression. So she actually got, um, got a vertebroplasty procedure, which we'll show you here in a, just a little bit. This is kind of how we do that. We go in with a needle uh, in through the back, uh, and then we inject cement through that needle to stabilize the fracture. Uh, and that actually repairs the uh, repairs the vertebra. We can use a balloon to kind of open up the ver uh, open up the space there, and uh, actually restore a little bit of the height as well. This is what that looks like under X-ray. So this is a a bone cannula going in through the uh, through the pedicle uh, of the vertebral body, a curved bone needle extending from that and going into the meat of the vertebral body itself, and then injection of radiopaque cement. And here you can see uh, on screen uh, right, this patient has had multiple of these uh, vertebral levels fixed because they have multiple compression fractures. Um, we can also treat other skeletal malignancies uh, and we can, we can basically do ablation or cement augmentation to help stabilize those things. Um, you know, obviously these in, in patients as they're living longer with cancer um, are becoming an increasing problem for folks uh, because you know, people are living longer with cancer, they're living longer with late metastatic disease, and then they're having problems related to, um, relating to, to fracture. Um, this is just how often bone mets happen, and as you can see, it's pretty frequent across multiple different types of cancers. How do we manage those patients? Same thing as, as before, narcotics, NSAIDs, you know, medical management, uh, and then potentially bisphosphonates to increase bone mineral density, but we can also do invasive procedures as well. So as Dr. Brown talked to you about, traditional uh, cancer therapy is kind of chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. Um, we're kind of that fourth pillar that's, uh, that's kind of an alternative to all of those sorts of things. So again, minimally invasive uh, therapies are very, very well suited to cancer patients. Um, and these are all the things that we've talked about before. Um, so we kind of evaluate the patient needs first. If there's underlying tumor in the place where we're trying to stabilize, we'll often uh, do ablative therapy to try to burn out or, or freeze out some of that tumor and then the nature of the, of the fracture. Uh, so we look to see if, if they have kind of instability at that level, you know, whether or not they're having uh, any pain related to the bone tumor interface and then what structures are around there that will be concerning to us as we're doing our procedure. So this is kind of what it looks like when we do something like an ablative procedure. So we stick a needle in, the ablation probe usually heats up or cools down at the very tip. That creates this thermal kind of lesion. Um, this is what it looks like and, uh, when you do an RFA. This is an uh, actual pig liver. So you can see this area in the middle 
looks like you know kind of cooked steak uh and the outer living tissue you know looks like that normal red stuff so like rare steak so it actually kind of cooks the tissue this is what it looks like under uh, microscopy and uh, again this is a, the combination of rf and then vertebroplasty so through the same access that we did that we do for uh to stabilize the bone we can actually put these needles in that get very hot or very cold on the end this is a combination therapy of rf ablation uh followed by vertebroplasty so we burnt out the tumor and then we stabilize the bone with that bone cement and that, that uh, dark stuff that you're seeing on screen right is the actual uh, bone cement so uh traditional therapy a lot of times these things these uh, patients will get radiation first uh Unfortunately, radiation can only go up to a certain dose limit before you start having complications relating to radiation. And that involves uh, basically since, since these are very close to the spinal column, you can get you know, uh, nerve injury as a result of that. So uh, in patients who are not good candidates for radiation, we can do these therapies. This is a similar case where we did RF ablation and you can see some of our RF probes we can kind of curve and point up or down uh, and get to different areas of the vertebral body where there is um, where there is cancer. This is kind of that cast of cement that you're seeing here with stabilization of that bone. And then this is what it looks like on CT down on screen right with stabilization of that bone. Uh, and this is what it kind of looks like after, after we're done. So it obviously stabilizes the fracture that's through the bone uh, and alleviates pain and prevents you know, any further fracture from, from going on. So we can treat bones you know, elsewhere in the human body. So this is uh, a patient who had a big hemangioma in their scapula, uh, and that's what you're seeing, that kind of eaten out uh, spot there up on uh, in the middle of the screen, in the middle of the scapula. So it's not only cancer that we can treat, we can treat many different conditions that affect the bone. Uh, so in this patient, we did a, a similar procedure where we did uh, a very cold needle. Uh, so we went in, we did, uh, accessed via CT, we put in this cold needle that got very cold on the end, froze the hemangioma, and then we filled that cavity with cement. And this is what it looks like before and after treatment. And actually, uh, that actually alleviated this patient's pain. So again, you know, a nice procedure that we can do for any patient with you know, kind of bone lesions to try to stabilize the bone. Um, one of the increasing areas, this is a, this is a patient I treated uh, probably about two years ago um, who had a uh, thyroid cancer that spread right above the acetabulum. So you can imagine if you're standing, you know, upright, all of your force, you know, from your, from your, you know, kind of weight is actually transmitted through the, the acetabular roof. And here you can see this patient has a kind of a punched out lesion in the acetabular roof where the, uh, the bone has been compromised. So uh, in the old days, if this patient got a fracture, they would have to have a, a major surgery, so a total hip replacement uh, to fix this lesion. Uh, nowadays, we can do things like um, palliative uh, uh, cementoplasty and, uh, and embolization. So we actually went in the day before. Uh, so the tumors tend to be very, very vascular uh, when, they, when they spread to the bone. Uh, in this case, we wanted to eliminate some bleeding risk. So we went in this, this big bright spot that you're seeing on screen left. Uh, is from an angiogram. So we went into the arteries that were feeding this area of bone. We did a contrast injection. All of that, that kind of dark cloud that you're seeing on screen left is actually tumor blush. So all of the, the blood vessels that the tumor is recruited. Screen middle is after we put in medical grade beads to plug up the arteries that lead to this tumor. So we're actually able to, to terminate the blood supply to the tumor. Uh, and then the next day we were able to poke uh, a hole in the bone, uh, and that's what you're seeing on bottom screen left. We were able to stick in needles that got very hot on the end to burn out this area of tumor. Uh, and then we were able to put cement in this area of tumor to stabilize the acetabular the roof. So you see this cast of cement there, which is replacing, you know, kind of serving as a surrogate for the bone there. So what does that look like to us uh, when we're actually doing the case? Bottom screen right is actually uh, this patient in the CT gantry. So this is, we do these things via either x-ray or CT. This patient was in CT for this, this procedure. You can see all of these things poking out of the, uh, of the patient. Those are our ablation needles. So we access via multiple different little sites. And then uh, these little white, the things that are white on the, on the end, those are the actual ablation needles that we put in through the, through the cannula. So we're able to, uh, to do the ablation uh, and do the cementoplasty. And all of these things happen through an incision about, about as big as like the white part of your pinky nail. So, 
Um, you know, when the patient leaves, they don't need stitches, they don't need to stay in the hospital very long, they're discharged the same day once the cement hardens. So uh, there are many different, you know, bone therapies that we can do uh, for patients in addition to some of the intravascular things that we talked about, IVC infiltration and those sorts of things. So you're getting a sense that, you know, we really touch uh, these patients in, uh, in many, many different aspects of their care. So from diagnosis to treatment, and we go head to toe. And that's kind of, I think, the take home of, uh, for you guys who are just getting, you know, kind of understanding what interventional radiology as a specialty is. We deal with bone problems. We deal with cancer-related problems. We deal with blood vessel problems. We open up blood vessels where, when appropriate or close down blood vessels when appropriate. So many, many different areas of the human body that we, that we uh, uh, affect treatment in. Um, so next, uh, Dr. Zlochenko, uh, George is going to talk to you guys about one of the other therapies that we can do um, uh, for, uh, uh, for uterine fibroids as well as uterine bleeding. And this will give you an idea for some of our, our patients you know, in the non-trauma setting, how we can help control bleeding. So, uh. Hey guys, um, finally got our, my presentation uploaded. Sorry about that. All right, so I'm gonna switch gears a little bit, um, talk about GYN and obstetric, obstetric indications for transcatheter embolization. Um, a lot of this is uh, kind of outpatient, uh, you know, outpatient procedures that we do. Um, I work mainly out of uh, Highlands Ranch location, um, so it's a little, little different case mix down there. So here we go. Um, so some advantages of transcatheter embolization. Um, you know, we kind of talked br briefly talked about this with other indications like interventional oncology. Um, it's minimally invasive. It can obviate surgery, decrease morbidity and mortality, and safeguard future fertility potential specifically in these uh, patients who are women who want uh, to preserve their fertility in the future. Um, so transcatheter integration into our, the treatment plan for these patients. Uh, we'll go over some of the clinical indications. I'll show some vascular anatomy um, techniques and potential risks and benefits of embolization. Um, so, pelvic vascular anatomy of a female, um, the uterine arteries come off of the proximal branches of the internal iliac arteries, artery. There are cervical vaginal branches um, that can arise from the uterine arteries, so you need to be careful of those when doing an embolization. Um, you can see anastomoses with ovarian arteries in between the left and right, and uh, anastomosis between the left and the right uterine artery is common. Um, then there's also, you know, there are arteries to the round ligament, they come off the internal iliac or inferior epigastric. It's not as important as a uterine artery. Um, another artery that's important is the ovarian artery. They um, arise from the aorta just below the renal arteries. They can often uh, supply the uterus um, in uh, ovarian anatomy. If, you know, some patients don't have a, a uterine on one side. You have to look for other potential supplies, which is, uh, could be an ovarian artery. So here's a uh, brief picture of the um, uh, vascular anatomy on an angiogram. Um, you can see kind of in the middle of the screen, the label UA, that those are the uterine arteries. Um, and we'll get some better pictures of them on the right, uh, on, on your uh, right over there. They're uh, classically, uh, the classic appearance is this squiggly uh, line with corkscrew vessel branches, um, especially when women, women have large fibroids, you start to get many, many branches and they all look like these corkscrew vessels on the right there with that uh, white arrow. This is an example of a uterine artery to uh, ovarian anastomosis. Um, so um, this happens a lot. Um, so you need something to be to watch out for that. You can see on the screen on the right, the uterine artery is a pacifying on an angiogram, and also you can see the ovary kind of a P-shaped or bean-shaped structure um, to the right of that fibroid that's um, pacifying. So some indications for embolization: um, electric treatment of uterine fibroids. Um, and also pelvic congestion syndrome. Um, 
we'll talk a little bit about pelvic congestion syndrome. It's a, from, it's a different approach than uh, what I just showed you from the uh, arterial um, from angiography for the uterine arteries. So a lot of these, uh, classically, these patients are referred to GYN from the primary care providers. Um, the main uh, ultimate treatment is uh, hysterectomy. You know, there's hormone treatment, NSAIDs, and different um, medical management, medical treatments that you can try. But ultimately, these patients, when they see a gynecologist, they'll be referred for a uh, hysterectomy. So what we're trying to do is give these patients another option. Um, we can also do this procedure for emergent or, uh, control vaginal or pelvic hemorrhage, um, postpartum hemorrhage. This is often where when we, when we get called in the middle of the night, you know, a woman has delivered a baby and they're having massive hemorrhage and vaginal packing and balloons and all these things that the OBs can do isn't stopping it. So um, that's a role we can play and this is actually very satisfying, basically save a young healthy woman's life um, with the NAWR procedure. Um, no absolute contra contraindications in, emergence, in an emergency, some elective contraindications, um, renal insufficiency, coagulopathy, contrast allergy, basically anything, um, any procedure that requires an angiogram, those are some similar contraindications. And specifically in these patients, you know, patients who have pelvic infection, uh, previous irradiation, intrauterine pregnancy, that's kind of obvious, um, or malignancy. Um, some techniques, angiography techniques, you can do radial or femoral access. Um, I do most of the procedures radially. This is much more comfortable for the patient. Um, and I'll show some pictures on the next slide. Um, it's performed in an IR suite. We can do a moderate sedation. Um, and then there's some, you know, so non-selective and selective angiography. Um, this is a picture of radial artery access. You may have heard of it uh, from um, cardiologists who are doing this uh, for coronary angiograms. Um, so but we can do this with our procedures too. You can imagine after an embolization of the fibroids, a woman is in a lot of pain. They want to kind of crawl up in the ball or get into a comfortable position. Can't do that if you have to keep your leg straight from femoral artery access. Um, so uh, radial artery access is preferred. Um, they can mobilize, they can move around, get comfortable, go to the bathroom right after the procedure. These are some catheters that uh, we can use to do the procedure. That one all the way on the right, I've never seen or used before. Um, so some embolization techniques, there's different agents that we can use, permanent, temporary. Um, so permanent ones are microspheres, uh, little microscopic um, particles that um, you can't see with the naked eye, but they're very small, so some pictures. PVA is vinyl alcohol, um, similar to microspheres. Liquid polymers, coils or plugs. Um, gel foam is a temporary agent um, that you can use in an emergency, like a postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, it's actually, you know, classic teaching is one to two weeks that they dissolve and then the artery revascularizes. It's actually, we're finding out now it's longer than that, but it is still temporary. Uh, here's some pictures of different, uh, different um, embolization uh, materials that we can use. Gel foam, you see those microspheres. Um, bottom right is an, as a plug. It's kind of you know, similar to coils, microspheres, or uh, they're both, it's also permanent, but it, you can use a lot less um, equipment to uh, shut down the vessel with a plug. Some complications. Um, so it's reported in the literature, it's six to 9%. Um, and in actuality, it's much lower than that. Some re related complications to the procedures, hematoma, dissection, allergy, nephrotoxicity. Um, related to the actual embolization procedure is post-embolization syndrome um, happens quite often. Um, almost 100% of patients, they're going to have pain. But the classic triad is pain, fever, and leukocytosis happens in 50%. Um, you can get vaginal discharge, fibroid passage, uh, when a fibroid necrosis, if it's submucosal or within the, within the uterine cavity or endometrial cavity, it can actually slough out. Um, uterine necrosis is very, very rare. Um, Non-target embolization, meaning beads or uh, particles getting into the wrong artery, um, that can actually lead to sexual dysfunction. Um, that's also very, very rare. 
um, ovarian failure due to unintended embolization via uterine ovarian anastomosis. Um, it's very un it's very rare in patients who are younger. Um, it can happen in patients who are older. Um, so it's something you should watch out for when watch out for when doing the procedure. Um, so kind of touched on um, some indications. Uterine fibroids is one indication. Adenomyosis, which is um, another cause of pelvic pain or dysmenorrhea um, in women. Um, it's, it's actually the endometrial glands invading the myometrium of the uterus, so basically proliferation of the endometrium. Um, it's not as effective as in uterine fibroids, but it is still effective in, um, in those patients. Gynecologic malignancies, and I'll show you some examples. Um, iatrogenic due to surgical procedure, uh, uterine ABMs, and uh, pelvic congestion syndrome, which is a, a venous procedure. Um, some some uh, information about uterine fibroids, very common. You can get menorrhagia, dysmenorrhea, uh, bulk symptoms. Um, they have excellent, we have excellent clinical results, about uh, greater than 90%. If uh, menorrhagia is the dominant symptoms, we can we can stop that bleeding immediately, um, and our success rates for that are even higher. Um, bulk symptoms you have requ we require um, the fibroids to shrink. That takes a little more time. Um, it's about three months. We use MRI for both uh, pre uh, pre procedure and follow up. Uh, not so much for follow up anymore, but uh, you know prior to their procedure, the patients would need an MRI. Uh, we, we do that because we want to see how much of the fibroid is perfused. Um, the, the size of the fibroid is not an indicator, a great indicator of the success of our procedure. It's more um, blood supply to the, to the fibroid. If it has robust blood supply, then um, our procedure will be more successful. If it doesn't, you can imagine, you know, we're not going to be able to embolize it as well. And maybe the patients actually don't need this procedure. There has been some studies about the durability of um, urine fibroid embolization, especially in young patients. A lot of it's been debunked, but if you can imagine, you know, say 30 year olds doing it, we're doing this procedure, they have time to recruit additional vessels and develop more fibroids, but usually we don't do it in patients that young. It's not as common. Here's some, uh, some pictures from the procedure um, up on the top. Uh, that's pre embolization. You can see uh, pacification of. The uterine arteries bilaterally uh, with these corkscrew vessels supplying uh, large fibroids. Um, on the bottom so the screen is the post embolization. You can see pruning or lack of pacification of these vessels. This is what the MRI looks like on the left. That's pre uh, embolization. Um, there's, you can see those kind of light shaded gray, two large fibroids. Um, and on the post scan, there's um, these black empty spaces where the fibroids were, and that's showing that there's no more blood flow to the, to the fibroids. Um, we can do this in gyne a similar procedure in gynecologic emergencies, um, but you know, malignancy, sorry. Um, usually it's managed surgically. Um, these um, tumors can invade arteries and cause major bleeding, especially cervical cancer. Um, you can have hemorrhage and advanced stage disease. So there's some other ways to manage the, the bleeding, vaginal packing, transfusion, radiation, chemotherapy, but patients with intractable bleeding is what, when we get involved, um, we can do an embolization for that. So this is an example of a woman with stage three cervical car uh, carcinoma on the screen there on the left, you can see that uh, ball contrast, um, that's pseudoaneurysm, that's basically actively extravasating. Um, and when you look on the right, you can see all that contrast, all that black is just basically blood spilling into the pelvis. Um, this, this procedure, uh, we, were, we did an embolization with gel foam um, and on a post scan, uh, post image on the right, basically there's, the anatomy is normal now, there's no longer any bleeding. Um, this is a similar case. Um, you can see on the right, that's that, all that um, kind of squiggly look, looking lines over there is vaginal packing, which wasn't working. So we did an embolization, and again, uh, this was actually done with MBCA, which is uh, basically is, is a glue, and um, also used microspheres. 
And you can see that there's no more pacification of that pseudoaneurysm with the black arrow on the left on the post uh, image. Um, this is also another you know, case. Um, you can see all this contrast extravasation in the pelvis. Um, this was done with gel foam and onyx. Onyx is not another type of liquid polymer used in, in the brain a lot. Um, so some gynecologic hemorrhages that are not associated with malignancy, pelvic surgery, um, it's not uncommon. Um, uterine AVMs, um, that's uh, pretty rare, but we do see it, especially with patients who've had, um, had procedures like DNCs or um, hysteroscopy, hysteroscopy, adenomyosis, as I mentioned before, and patients who, have, um, who are coagulopathic. Um, urine ABMs, they can be rare, congenital, required, um, required from surgical instrumentation, as I said before. Um, they can have heavy vaginal bleeding often during their um, menstrual cycle. Um, ultrasound is a great diagnostic tool for these. It's really all, all, what, the only thing you need. Um, these were classically treated with hysterect hysterectomy, but um, we can do embolization to treat these um, disorders. Here's an ultrasound. You can see this on the top left. That uh, bright yellow or orange picture is, is blood flow. That's um, within the um, myometrium, uh, consistent with an AVM. Um, this is a, an angiogram example of an AVM. Um, you can often see, you know, it's, it's a connection, abnormal connection between the, the uh, artery and the vein. Um, if you let the angiogram play out, you can actually see a pacification of the venous system in the IVC. Um, this, on the left, here's an example of an AVM, and on the right is post-embolization with um, PVA and onyx. Adenomyosis, uh, talked about it before. Um, Transcanthal embolization is not as, as durable with this, but you still get 65% um, symptomatic relief at, at 40 months. Um, pelvic congestion syndrome, um, this is kind of a contest, uh, you know, it's an interesting um, syndrome that patients have and heavily debated. Um, so basically, um, clinically, these patients have greater than six months of non-cyclic pelvic pain. They have uh, distension of their ovarian and pelvic uh, veins. Um, they have ovarian vein valvular insufficiency. Um, they'll have deep pelvic pain, dyspareunia, dysmenorrhea, postcoital pain. Um, the, the main um, clinical indicator is their symptoms at the worst at the end of the day and improved with lying down, similar to other um, valvular insufficiency problems like varicose veins in the legs. Um, they can actually have ovarian point tenderness, so they actually point to where it hurts, and that's actually pointing to their ovary where all these um, blood vessels are distended with blood. Um, they're often, you often see them with multi paris women, women in their late 20s and 30s. Um, diagnosis mainly clinical, but you can attenuate the diagnosis with uh, imaging. Or you can see these tortuous dilated pelvic veins um, on ultrasound CT or MRI. Um, so we treat this by selective ovarian venography. Um, the first part of it on venography, it helps you also clinch the diagnosis. Usually the ovarian veins are large. When you inject contrast, they, there's a retrograde flow down into the pelvis instead of up back to the IVC or the heart. Um, you can see collateral pelvic venous pathways um, and de delayed or stagnant clearance. Treatments, none of these work too well. Um, these patients get shuffled from doctor to doctor. Some, pa some patients have seen psychiatrists because they Doc, you know, doctors can't figure out their, well, why they're having pain. They often don't believe them. So um, these patients do go through significant pain and real symptoms and are having trouble finding treatments for it. So that's where transcatheter embolization comes in. Um, you do have to watch out for obstructive venous lesions that can cause secondary um, pelvic congestion syndrome. And I'll, I'll show an example of that. Um, so, so transcatheter embolization for P PCS, um, we embolize the ovarian veins with coils and plugs. Um, we occlude the urine pelvic veins, you know, deep pelvic veins with sclerosin. So basically killing the lining of the um, blood vessels so that they pretty much shrivel up and die. 
you need sclerosin or gel foam for that. Sometimes you have to embolize the internal iliac vein tributaries with sclerosin because they start to develop all these different pathways to get the blood back to the, uh, to the heart. Uh, we have good, good clinical success and there's no negative effect on menses or fertility. Here's an example. You can see all these, all these white arrows showing dilated pelvic veins on uh, both sides of the uterus. Um, on the right is an uh, ovarian venogram. Um, you can see a large dilated um, left ovarian vein. Usually it's more common on the left because the left ovarian vein um, enters the left renal vein, so you have a, a longer pathway for the blood to go. Um, so there's more real estate basically for the, for the valves to be um, insufficient. Um, this is some more images from that same case with now contrast going deep into a pelvis. And you can see all these big, basically sacks of blood on the left image um, where the blood's just staying there stagnant and women are walking around with this and it's a lot of severe pressure and pain. Um, the middle image is the embolization with uh, coils and plugs there, mostly plugs. Um, this is just an, uh, an example of a, and now an older patient who had uh, chronic pelvic pain had a hysterectomy, so you would think, why, you know, why is she having um, this pelvic pain? Um, but we well, we did a left renal venogram and actually uh, found that she had left renal vein occlusion, and all these um, tributaries are forming around the occlusion to um, bring black blood back from the kidney to the heart, um, and they actually develop bigger ovarian vein collaterals um, in this scenario. And that's what you can see on that image on the right. Um, this patient had a renal vein stent. Um, now you can see um, this little metal stent. It's hard to see on the image on the left, but basically those um, vessels are now longer present in the ovarian vein. Um, there's now normal flow through the renal vein. Uh, we talked about some of this, uh, you know, other now obstetric indications for transcatheter embolization, postpartum hemorrhage. You actually do it for placental implantation abnormalities. That's much rare. Um, and cervical ectopic pregnancies. So postpartum hemorrhage um, basically is defined as greater than 500 cc's of vaginal or one liter of blood loss from a C-section. Um, there's all typical usual um, maneuvers to handle these patients, fluids, blood products, vasopressors, uterine balloon tamponade and vaginal packing. We usually use gel foam embolization. Um, these patients often want to preserve their fertility, so we do a temporizing agent. Uh, it's very effective, we can repeat it, um, and obviously a patient does not need a hysterectomy. Um, you know, we can do the same procedure for placental ab abnormalities, um, and just there's a different different type of placental abnormalities, uh, implantation abnormalities, accreta, increta, and percreta. You'll learn about all this if you haven't yet. Um, so these patients can have uh, you know massive bleeding upon delivery. So um, sometimes we get called in to do these procedures. I'm kind of going to skip through this. Um, let me just I'll just mention this placenta accreta. Um, you know. The treatment is early delivery C-section with hysterectomy. We can do transcatheter embolization. At time of delivery, we can put a balloons prior in the IR suite and the patient can go into have a C-section. Um, and then we can inflate the balloons if there's any massive bleeding. We can also do it in the OR. Um, here's a patient with per placenta percreta where the placenta basically gets implanted and starts uh, to go to invade uh, other structures. Um, this is the angiogram, it looks like, uh, so basically a hypervascular uterus, uh, kind of like if you, you would see in a, uh, a fibroid patient, although you don't see those corkscrew vessels, but you see it, all this blood flow to the uh, placenta. You can also do an uh, embolization for cervical ectopic, uh, this is very rare. Uh, you can also treat this with uh, ultrasound guided injection of gestational sac or methotrexate. KCL or hyperosmolar glucose, but um, uterine artery embolization can be done also if, it's, if those other um, treatment measures are not effective. Here's an example of that. And again, kind of similar pictures to ones we've shown below. You're seeing hypervascularity on the pre-embolization images and then 
um, that lack of hypervascularity and post procedure post procedure angiogram. Um, I'm gonna skip through that. So this is a, a hot topic and questions that we always we often get um, when seeing these patients. Fertility after embolization. Um, so basically, pregnancies are often carried to term. There have been reports of increased pregnancy complications like miscarriages. Um, there's no reported negative effects on fertility after uterine arm embolization for postpartum hemorrhage because it's a temporizing agent. Um, uterine fiber embolization has been associated with a risk of ovarian failure, as I mentioned before. Uh, we tell these patients, you know, we can't guarantee that you will have normal fertility after, but um, you will have infertility if you have a hysterectomy. So, you know, it's a fine line there, but patients who need this, need something, you know, done because say they're anemic from their uh, fibroids, they want to preserve their fertility or have a chance to preserve it. Um, that's where, you know, we come in and we can at least um, give them a chance. If they're otherwise get a hysterectomy, they have zero chance of preserving their fertility. Um, so some con just conclusion, um, you know, when experienced IR team, um, transcatheter embolization can successfully treat both obstetric and gynecologic hemorrhages. Um, it's also useful to treat pelvic congestion syndrome and symptomatic fibroids, but we need to appropriately screen these patients. So that's it. Um, all right, so we'll have about another 10 minute break and then Dr. Rashawn's gonna give his lecture and then we'll do our open forum. Okay, everyone, we're gonna uh, get started again for our, I guess, noon activities. Um, and for those who are actually still uh, linked in through um, teleconference, thank you for still being with us. Uh, the next hour, what we're gonna do is bring everything back together, still focusing on intervention radiology, but taking a step back and to see, well, what uh, at, uh, impact does health disparities, diversity and inclusion have on this? And then after this quick lecture, we're gonna have an open panel and forum. Uh, we'll have some of our uh, residents uh, up here for all of you to ask questions about anything about uh, interventional radiology and matriculation into um, uh, medical school. I know we have some advanced practice provider students as well. Um, we can uh, also try to answer some questions there, uh, both from the resident level and at, actually on a faculty level. So um, I have the privilege of uh, giving all of the courtesy to Dr. Vashal Kumar, uh, who was uh, scheduled to give this talk, but due to a little technical difficulty, not able to. So all of these slides are actually his. He is an assistant professor at University of California, San Francisco. Um, some of you who are online or here may know him as the chair of the student and resident committee of the Society of Interventional Radiology, which I like to just tell all medical students, that is a resource that um, all of you should be involved in if you have even a slightest interest in, uh, in interventional radiology. Membership is free. The Medical Student Council has a lot of resources and also through the resident and fellow section. You can actually get that from the sirweb.org and also at our advanced practice provider um, students. There's also an MP and PA section that I would uh, also encourage you to look into. Um, so without further ado, we'll get into health disparities in IR. Um, so we do minimally invasive image guided procedures to diagnose and treat diseases. Uh, Dr. Ryu talked about the father of IR, uh, Charles Dodder, and um, this is Sven Seldinger. Uh, he actually um, introduced the technique to do central venous access and any other vascular access. Um, this technique is simpler uh, than it appears on paper and after a little practice should, pre um, should present no difficulties. So basically we get into a vessel now so uh, with ultrasound guidance, you will learn that uh, later on, see some of that in our workshops. Place a wire through the vessel, uh, through the uh, catheter. Catheter comes out, dilate or obturate the vessel to go ahead and insert your central venous catheter. 
as we said earlier in the couple of a few lectures that you had uh, pertaining to IR, we likely break these into systems, thoracic, GI, GU, vascular. And within all these systems, these few systems, there's tons of procedures that we can actually uh, make an impact for services and ultimately the patient and patient's family. Also, hepatobiliary, renal, musculoskeletal, gynecologic, tons of procedures that we have associated with that. So why does this matter altogether? Well, it's like the tree, trees are to the forest as innovation is to the patient. Um, in 2018, the US Census Bureau found that fewer Americans are living in, po in poverty, fewer Americans. But the report also says that that's around 27 and a half million people or 8.5% of Americans who do not have health insurance for all of 2018 compared to just uh, under 8% in 2017. So we get into bias in medicine. There's bias throughout all aspects of life, but we see this more so here. And that's what leads to bias training that you, will, you have in your medical education and we continue to have uh, in healthcare. In fact, we need to have more of it. So let us not forget the innovation uh, and technology that have been, has been the heart of exploitation uh, many of the vulnerable uh, populations throughout history, starting off with um, Henrietta, Henrietta Lacks, uh, with the, suffered through cervical cancer therapy, my apologies, um, the Tuskegee Institute, uh, as well as um, experimental surgery on enslaved women suffering from vaginal fistulas after childbirth. So the objectives of this uh, short talk is to examine evidence pertaining to healthcare disparities within commonly encountered pathophysiologies, which are related to IR, discuss strategies to improve patient outreach and education and improve our provider knowledge of existing disparities. So when we talk about disparities, it's not just race, it's not just sex, age, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, gender identity, health beliefs and practices, environment, the list goes on and on and on. And that's where diversity, equity, inclusion comes into play and why it's so important, not only in interventional radiology, not only in our department of radiology, but across the board in multiple aspects of medicine. So the scope of what we're going through, some of it was touched on in a more comprehensive fashion in, in other lectures, but we'll go through some of the disease processes where we have some documented data on uh, healthcare disparities. So we'll start off with PAD first, and uh, Dr. Kumar says if daughter only knew what impact he would have had on pretty much all of vascular disease. So let's talk about CLI, rest pain and ischemia with tissue loss. About one to three of, um, three percent of PAD patients may have this. The mor morbidity is about half of the patients um, will die. Um, this is what you will may see in your clinic or may see in the ER. But what we would need to do is to try and reperfuse this as uh, much as possible. A lot of these are actually through endovascular techniques, uh, but patients also have options of surgical bypass, but they have a 30% morbidity and a 5% mortality. Uh, this is angiograms of the first PTA that uh, Dr. Dodder did uh, back in the day, just uh, showing increased perfusion. The awareness of PAD is getting more and more, especially in interventional radiology. Peripheral vascular disease in general is, sh is a shared space with vascular medicine, interventional cardiology, vascular surgery, but also interventional radiology. In fact, we have some data that Dr. Schramm and Dr. Trevetti have uh, collaborated on across the United States showing that uh, that's been will be published soon, that IRs are still in the game, but we are actually really being uh, doing a lot of the CLI patients. Those patients who need complex reconstructions below the knee to save their leg. Associated disparities with PAD, it's more prevalent in African-American population compared with Hispanic and non-Hispanic white population, and it's across all, uh, all age groups. Women compared to men have a higher 30-day uh, uh, mortality risk, major amputation, and worse outcomes with graft thrombosis, vascular access complications, and cardiopulmonary events. But why is this the case? There's more and more research that we need to do of why different ethnicities, different races, different sexes actually have these issues. 
So in terms of the, uh, the influence on race and uh, surgical procedures, this was just um, a, a study that showed that really African-American patients were significantly more likely than white patients to undergo above the knee, below the knee, and on toe amputations, and significantly had a lower extremity uh, revascularization with PTA and stenting. So that's PAD. Now let's move on to stroke. Um, time is brain. Within the residency curriculum, there's a new push through the Society of Interventional Radiology to include neuro intervascular work, particularly stroke, in the curriculum. We have instituted, or we have instituted here this year, and you will see that across the board. Um, stroke can be ischemic and hemorrhagic. Worldwide, it's the second leading cause of death and third leading cause of disability. Minority ethnic groups have higher rates of stroke. Uh, we talk about endovascular means. Well, this is a meta-analysis showing that um, it achieves endovascular ther therapy achieves better patient outcomes at 90 days than standard medical therapy. So there is a role for IR to actually participate in stroke therapy. Stroke therapy, compared uh, in parallel to PAD, is shared uh, with neurosurgeons and also neurointensivists. But IRs have the techniques and the management skills to actually participate in this if you would like to. Uh, these are just diagnostic images. Again, DR is really important, showing that this is that dense MA uh, on your left of the screen, right of the patient, the dense M uh, MC MCA sign. This is CTA showing that there's no flow going to that region. And then the goal of ischemic stroke therapy is reperfusion. Again, time is brain. I won't go into the specific techniques that we do this, but they're really cool. Now the health disparities. Um, in this study, African-Americans were significantly less likely to undergo cerebral arteriography and carotid endarterectomy. There are also other studies that show racial variations altogether uh, with stroke. Leading, going into trauma, um, a lot of institutions are level one trauma centers. We are one here at the University of Colorado, leading to death. You break it, we fix it. Um, there are a lot of cases that come in where patients need to be stabilized. IR is the number one. We're involved in the trauma team. We, we're activated. Our team comes in and we help to fix a bleed along with the patient actually being uh, reperfused, uh, open abdomens, but we have the um, minimally invasive means to actually stop bleeds. So where does it come into? Ratio and insurance status as risk factors for trauma mortality. Uh, it does have a, a predicts outcome after trauma. African-Americans, Hispanic, and uninsured patients uh, were shown to have worse outcomes, but insurance status appeared to have a stronger association with mortality after trauma. Um, Dr. Zwachinko talked about women's health. That's a huge practice. Whenever we talk about healthcare disparities throughout uh, the sexes and also uh, um, uh, races. So no matter what your stance on with, uh, is with abortion, uh, unsafe abortion uh, carries, carried out either by persons lacking the necessary skills or an environment that, that does not conform to minimally invasive medical standards represents 56% of inducing uh, abortions, which was an increase from 44% in 1995 to 49% in 2008. Now, we also think about the effects that healthcare has uh, on uh, people of color. Now we bring into uh, uh, Serena Williams, uh, one of the uh, best tennis players that we've, we've known. So with childbirth, this is uh, in Vogue magazine, she was uh, not feeling right, um, just uh, was feeling lightheaded and going up to get to the, uh, going to the restroom, the nurse thought her pain medicine might be causing her confusion, but she just didn't feel right. She had a little bit of um, uh, knowledge of what was going on and did a Doppler ultrasound, no clot there, did a CT scan and had a PE. So, and all in all, African-Americans have a remarkable 30% higher risk of DVT and PE than the Caucasian population. Black women are 243% more likely than white women to die from pregnancy or child-related causes, which produces one of the largest racial disparities in women's health. So just the intersection of different types of disparities altogether, racism, sexism, heterosexism, and classism. Um, 
In terms of the disparity in pregnancy-related mortality from five conditions, we talked about, well, there's preeclampsia, eclampsia, previa, and postpartum hemorrhage, things that Dr. Zlachenko talked about. Well, black women with these conditions were two to three more times more likely to die from them than white women. Uh, Dr. Zachenko gave a nice example of some postpartum hemorrhage, extravasation seen here from the left uterine artery into the endometrial canal, and then this was actually um, treated with coil and gel foam embolization, things that interventional radiology does. Still in the realm of women's health, fibroid disease. It's a minimally invasive uh, technique for fibroid embolization or uterine artery embolization. It's, fibroids are the most benign smooth muscle tumor of the uterus. Uh, Dr. Zachenko talked about this and it occurs in about 70% of women, but leading to the health disparities of uterine fibroids for African-American women, it is a, um, a public issue. Um, so in addition to African-American women having a health disparity here, they have a greater lifetime in in incidence of fibroid tumors and a threefold increase of age-adjusted incidence rate, rate and a threefold increase of relative risk of fibroid tumors when adjusted. So social economic factors, Laparoscopic hysterectomy for selected um, benign diseases uh, shows that black women were two to three more times more likely to undergo a hysterectomy than having awareness of other therapies such as uterine fibroid embolization. So the, there needs to be more and more awareness out there for options. And in fact, we have more and more women who are actually coming to our clinic being self-referred and, be, and knowing about these particular uh, disease or treatment uh, modalities through social media, through other advertisements, rather than seeing their gynecologist. This is just a uh, representative images of a fibroid uterus and treatment therapies would be medical therapy, surgical and image guided therapy. Dr. Zachinko talked about this, so I'll just move on. And as I said before in my, in my talk about interventional radiology being magic, well, it's kind of like surgery, but it's not. Image-guided therapies, we have fibroid embolization and uh, HIFU, MR-guided. These are just some uh, representative examples that were uh, talked about before. We'll, we'll skip that here. So moving on to venous, venous thromboembolic disease. Dr. Trevetti talked about IVC filters. This, this disease process goes across the board. Uh, Dr. Brown talked about IO. Well, a lot of our oncology patients have a higher risk for DVT. Um, you know about Virchow's triad, hypercoagulable state, a vascular wall injury, and circulatory stasis. It leads to all of that. But we can actually have a role in actually taking care of these patients who have significant DVTs or PEs. Won't go into the algorithm here. Patients need to be anticoagulated first, but we also are involved in multiple roles, such as our PE response team here at University of Colorado as well as other um, uh, institutions have it as well. Typically, we start off with a lower extremity uh, ultrasound. On the left, we see that things are actually compressed in the common femoral vein. When it does not compress, that's a DVT. Um, filters that were discussed uh, by Dr. Trevetti, PEs as well, multidisciplinary team, catheter-directed thrombolysis, this is a pulmonary artery, trying to uh, get this cloud out if patients uh, have any contraindication to lytic therapy. There are also other means of um, thrombectomy removal. So now, you know, let's put this on a higher stage. We have our, uh, our athletes. No one is actually um, uh, is protected from what can actually happen. All of us are um, privy to blood clots, uh, athletes, but this is where it actually gets in the higher stage. And this is what Dr. Ryu was saying well, IRs are not being um, put out there. Well, we can actually treat this, surgeons or whoever the primary care, and that's okay. But IR can have a huge impact on all of these patients, especially whenever we talk about healthcare disparities. Um, this is a disease process, uh, end-stage renal disease that is actually close to the University of Colorado. Dr. Trevetti has done a remarkable job in terms of database research and looking at patients with dialysis and end-stage renal disease. And these patients come from all crosses, all aspects of life. And when we look at our dialysis patients and the significance that it has on their healthcare, their quality of life, they're in dialysis units three days out of a week. Some of them may actually come into our clinic and they come into our lab to fix their access, 
give them central venous access, open it up. A lot of them don't know why they're here. And we've, we wonder, well, why do these patients don't show up for our, uh, our clinic appointments? Compliance, yes, but every single day they're in some type of healthcare facility. But we have the opportunity to actually improve their quality of life. Um, hemodialysis of over 600,000 patients uh, in the U.S. are being treated for kidney failure, and over 450,000 patients are on dialysis. Um, there's peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis that we uh, have uh, a, a definite role in. Uh, something actually coming out, and Dr. Brown will be leading this effort here, uh, dialysis access creation. These things are actually were formerly done by vascular surgeons, also a transplant surgeon, general surgeons, but we have a role now. There is a technique of percutaneous dialysis creation, access creation. That's remarkable whenever we can just take a couple of catheters, place, this, place these in patients, maybe having some magnets or a needle to create that fistula. Innovation is where we are. This is a tunnel line. We usually don't like to leave these uh, central venous catheters because of increased risk of infection and other aspects that it, things that it can actually do to our central venous system. Um, this is just an uh, application of uh, fistula sites, the distal form or the, um, the seminal fistula. We can also actually go up the arm, brachial basilic and brachial cephalic. Ways that the, uh, dialysis is actually uh, accomplished, uh, inflow and outflow. This is not an uncommon region where we have stenosis of um, uh, outflow vessel. Sometimes we can angioplasty, sometimes we can place a stent graft. It's what can happen with patients who have these central outflow stenoses, the vascular anatomy, and we're um, called upon, um, not so rare to actually open these up for patients. This is just an example of a right upper extremity brachiocephalic occlusion. We don't see contrast going into the heart. Uh, this was a sharp recanalization. At the top left, you see that this wire was actually snared through and through. And then with angioplasty and stenting, this was actually opened up. So this patient's circuit was actually preserved um, throughout. Okay, that's dialysis in general, but the health disparities that it has with initial uh, hemodialysis access, um, this was a, a study of over 350,000 patients, and it showed that more white patients had initiated hemodialysis with an AV fistula than black patients or Hispanic patients. Again, uh, with chronic kidney disease, African Americans are three to four times more likely than their non-Hispanic white counterparts to progress to end-stage renal disease and require uh, replacement therapy. Uh, we'll finish up with end-stage liver disease. Uh, just cartoon patients come in with uh, liver disease. They have uh, manifestations such, such as uh, ascites, portal hypertension, uh, how much fluid you can actually drain off of your patient sometimes, uh, what we see on ultrasound here. Uh, won't go into this algorithm of you know, how race and cultural factors, socioeconomic factors can actually lead to some of the, a lot of the disparities just across interventional oncology and liver disease. Some known disparities and risk factors. There's a high hepatitis B prevalence in Asian immigrant populations, unchanged trends of heavy drinking amongst Black and Hispanic men, and NASH, or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, disproportionately higher in Hispanic communities. So tons of disparities across the board that in a disease process, intervention radiology plays a large role in the multidisciplinary team. Blacks and Hispanics with uh, Hepatitis C have less likely or, le or less likely to be referred for medical therapy. It's been shown that Blacks and Hispanics were less likely to receive temporizing shunts, such as TIPS for ascites and variceal bleeding, and blacks, blacks and Hispanics were less likely to receive liver transplantation. Just health disparities across the board that we can have an impact on. In summary, review the evidence pertaining to healthcare disparities with commonly encountered pathophysiologies in IR. Hopefully this employed some knowledge on patient uh, outreach and education. We still have a lot of work to, get, to do on multiple levels. Students, faculty, IRs, multidisciplinary teams, and we still need the research out there. Um, and Dr. Uh, Vishal Kumar and Derek West um, recently wrote an article, Bridging the Equity Gap, Healthcare Disparities, that was published in uh, AJR. Um, there are a few people who are really passionate about this, but we need everyone on board. It starts off with unconscious bias, these bias trainings, but 
this goes further with healthcare disparities that we see and also pipeline education for different groups. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Kumar, if you're, um, if you're on and everyone else who are on, um, on Zoom and thank you all for being here. I think we're going to go on to the panel right now. Dr. Shram is going to introduce them. Yeah, so uh, we're just going to invite all the you know residents and uh, other uh, staff here uh, just to come up. Um, people can grab a seat here uh, or sit down kind of on the ledge here. Just uh, we're going to take a few minutes just to answer any questions that you guys have about, you know, what's your what's our day to day you know life like? How is the training for interventional radiology from the resident standpoint? Uh, what it's like to be an attending in interventional radiology, what your you know day-to-day -day, uh, kind of stuff is. Uh, so um, if you guys want to come on up uh, and then we'll give the folks who are here a chance to ask questions. And as soon as you guys run out of questions, we'll just uh, head upstairs and get started on the, uh, the actual um, practical course. Also for people that are <clears throat> still streaming in, if you have questions, you can type them into the uh, chat box through the Zoom software, and we can see your questions. Oh, oh yeah, that, that would actually be, yeah, that'd be easier. I'm going to stop sharing really quick so that the chat. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm just going to repeat the questions for um, for the folks who are listening in uh, remotely. So that was just um, the, the nuts and bolts of the question were how does the relationship work between interventional radiology and diagnostic uh, radiology as you train together, but then kind of separate off a little bit uh, at the towards the end of training. So what I'm understanding. So uh, I'll leave it open to the forum. Anybody want to field that? Yeah. Um, so, I'm one of the fourth year higher the residents. Um, I'm actually just kind of at that transition point where you go from being studying diagnostic radiology to starting to focus on in interventional radiology. Um, I will say that for the most part, the training for the first three years is essentially mirrored by the diagnostic studies. So, you get more than adequate training assistance to the two levels as well in diagnostic radiology, which is really a differentiator in, in what your skill set will kind of bring to bear as a practicing physician. Um, I'm not really, I have not been treated any differently by my diagnostic colleagues as such. And uh, then once you finally get into the IR training, it, having that strong diagnostic background really helps you then understand these image guided procedures that you're doing. Because a lot of this is understanding and knowing exactly what's going to be you're in your way where your target is going to have to work it out. And when you're looking at that with these different imaging modalities, be it ultrasound, MRI, CT, whatever, um, you need to have that foundation in order to successfully do this. Um, so here, I, I think we've had a very seamless transition. Uh, there isn't any sort of weird bias or anything like that. And so that would be kind of yeah, I think the advantage of, uh, of how we do our training is that, so if you go through as a diagnostic radiology resident, at the uh, termination, you know, of your five years, you take a, a board exam about, um, you know, about a year or so after you're done, and then you get to be diagnostic certified, so you're certified in diagnostic radiology. When you do interventional radiology, 18 months after your interventional training is done, you take a, you take a similar test, but it has a diagnostic component and an interventional component. Uh, when you do those two things, you're actually then become board certified in interventional radiology and diagnostic radiology. So not every job is like my job, which is almost 100% uh, 
procedures, you know, with some imaging. Now, when you're out in the community, you know, say you go and you want to, you're from Montana and you want to go up and you want to practice in rural Montana. Now, they might, may not have interventional radiology procedures to fill your entire day. So often, jo oftentimes jobs are, you know, 70-30 or 50-50 interventional and diagnostic. So it's actually an additional skill set on top of, you know, the diagnostic training. So it's nice in that aspect when you, when you come out that you have a little bit more, a um, little bit more, uh, you know, leveraging in terms of what you can, what you can cover, uh, which is, which is nice, especially, you know, this isn't as much of a concern as it was a couple of years ago, but with advancements in, in AI and things like that, I think, you know, when I was talking to medical students a couple of years ago, they were worried that the sky was falling because AI is going to take their job. Now, AI, you know, as far as I know, can't take a catheter, go up into the liver, go up out, you know, figure out which which artery leads to the tumor and go and inject, you know, chemotherapy into that tumor. So I think our job security um, is, is very good. Uh, similarly, you know, we take care of minimally invasive procedures. So um, the trend in surgery has been a large trend towards minimally invasive because that's better for the patient by and large. So uh, as minimally invasive specialists, you know, your job, your job, the job opportunities and job security and interventional radiology are, have never been better, I don't think. So uh, that's kind of one of the, one nice thing to kind of springboard off of the IR and DR kind of question. Yeah. Interventionalists are also excellent diagnostic radiology side. And I think we should all be proud of our you know, diagnostic radiology care teachers are in the special field that interpret and use at a high level. The procedures themselves, when you learn them, are somewhat straightforward, but they're only straightforward if you really have a good understanding. To have a foot in both the clinical and radiological. Yeah, so the question was, uh, was, was, what's our general day like and what's the work, work life balance? And then we'll start with, again, with the trainees, what their day to day life is like a, as a, as a IR kind of centric trainee, and then we can move up to the faculty. Yeah, you want to go to the mic? Um, so I'm the uh, chief resident of PGY6, and Eric over there is one of the fellows. It's the last year of his dying breed. Uh, our day-to-day -day life, because um, now it's really what I'm living, I usually get in around 6.30 and go home probably around 6.30, so it's certainly not short days. Uh, you're busy pretty much the whole day working from when you sit down to when you go home. Uh, we take call about one every four days, uh, and that's an overnight call, which is very variable. You may go home and sleep all night, hopefully, uh, or you may be coming back in to do some pretty interesting cases. Uh, this year is work-life balance is arguably not the best that you'll ever get, um, but you're still home half the time and three out of every four weekends, you are completely free of any clinical responsibility here. So uh, plenty of time to kind of do whatever it is that you need to do outside of work. 
Um, if there's a time you want to be busy, though, it's when you're in your last year of training, because what we do now is really going to establish the groundwork for whatever job we have going out into the world. Um, most people say that this is also the hardest year. So um, that's how bad it gets. I'm fine with that. Yeah, so generally the, the last year of training, as, as Chris said, is is kind of the, the most strenuous year on your personal life, uh, just because it's, it's the most intense year for training because you're really, this is like a, it's an apprenticeship and this is the last year of the apprenticeship. So you're effectively running the practice. Uh, now we are, we are very much involved in care, um, but our job is to make sure that when Chris is done, that he is a polished, finished product, that when he goes out his first day as a, you know, out in the wild as his own, as his own being, that he has, you know, no sweat on his brow when he does his first you know, set of cases because he has experienced everything we have taught him as much as we, we can. Uh, so that teaching takes time and those experiences don't all happen within business hours. As Chris said, we're part of the trauma service. We come in for emergent bleeding. We come in for, you know, abscesses that may need to be drained in the middle of the night because someone is septic, uh, cholangitis, all those sorts of things. So, you know, our, our job does not stop, you know, at 5 p.m., which is, you know, in the diagnostic world, it's very much shift work. Uh, you know, so you have a set time from X time to X time that you're covering the reading room. Uh, in interventional radiology, if you have call cases, you know, or, or something is, needs to be done in the middle of the night, it's very much like a surgical subspecialty where, you know, the surgeons, you know, take call just as we take call, you know. So um, that being said, you know, when you're an attending, you have, you know, a set number of group in our, in our practice, we have, a, you know, our full contingent is eight partners. So here at the university, that's one in eight, you know, weekends or, or weekdays that we would need to be covered um, in our average day. Uh, I would say, again, so obviously being the, in a trainee seat, they're here longer than we are. We generally get in somewhere between 7 and 7.30. I'll probably leave somewhere between 6 and 6.30 on an average full work day. Now, that being said, not every day is dedicated to only procedures. Some days we do multidisciplinary conference in lieu of doing procedures. And some days we do, you know, we have days for academic work where I'm doing research or other things, which are a little bit less time, you know, a little bit more flexible on time. Yeah. Um, one of the things we come back to when we're going out and trying, trying to find a job uh, in the MRI technology. The cool thing about IMR is there is tremendous variability in terms of how you can go where you can go. IRs are in the hospital, IRs are in what's called an OBL, an outpatient based or hazard based outpatient based procedure. IRs are covering hospital clients. So each one of these different practices, you're, you're not pigeonholed any one type of practice. And so if it's something where you don't want, for whatever reason, you know, you don't want to have to be on call, you know, or, or covering employees or, you know, whatever it is kind of you don't want to do. I think in IR you have a lot of ability to kind of build your practice the way you want to because we're in so many different practice settings. And so that's what I'm kind of seeing right now out on the job hunt. Is that you have a lot of um, opportunity to kind of shape. Yeah, but it's running through the computer actually. So. One of the things that yeah. I think is really cool about this group. I can just add from the um, a, a part of, you guys might come up just because our mic's running through the, this separate computer. So just so that our folks, because we were having some questions filter in from that. Yeah, if you would. Sorry, it's just so that they can hear us. I know it's not trying to be formal or anything, but just so that they can hear you. It's, it's running through here, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, just for pediatric interventional radiology, it's a little bit different than what uh, the adult guys do. So I'm uh, primarily over at the Children's Hospital, and um, I just come over one day a week and do a little bit of adult still, but uh, for the most part, I work with children, and it's a you know a little bit uh, more specialized in terms of your age population and the kinds of procedures you're going to do is are going to be different. But I would say that um, I think it's incredibly rewarding um, and an incredibly great field to be uh, part of, and always expanding, always growing. And um, 
you know, other things that we kind of do a lot out of children's hospitals and a lot of other hospitals as well as um, multidisciplinary clinics. So, um, you know, we do a lot of work with astral anomalies at the Children's Center, at, you know, and we actually do um, have, uh, you know, clinic days where we spend at least half a day in clinic, um, anywhere from 12 to 20 patients that um, may require your interventional skills. So those are some other things to add into it. And then I think also since we're such a small um, specialized field, uh, they don't, hospitals don't need that many of us. So our call is a bit more. So we run about one in four and some places run one in three on call. But our call essentially is also a lot lighter, um, I think, than the adult side. Um, we don't get so many traumas and we don't get as many um, GI bleeds. So those are some of the emergent things you might see on the adult side, but we can still get the septic kid and we still get cholangitis and both those things. Uh, so it's a really good question. I'll, I'll kind of answer broad, broadly. Um, you, you know, when you go into residency, you're going to devote a certain number of years of your life to the craft, you know, getting good at medicine, taking care of your patients, being good at what you do takes a certain amount of time and effort, and there's no getting around that. So, you know, whatever you do, expect residency to be a time where you have cyclical work-life balance. You know, you're not going to have day-to-day -day necessarily week-to-week, month-to-month. -month. Uh, but if you choose the right career that resonates with you, what you do, which you're going to do a lot of, is going to, you know, it's going to make you happier. Um, and, you know, you'll find meaning in that work, which is part of, you know, what you're doing right now is really appropriate, which is feeling out whether this is the right choice for you, right? So that's where the foundation starts. In training, the two, you know, diagnostic and interventional are kind of yin and yang in the sense that, you know, it's essential, they're synergistic, you need to understand the diagnostic portion and do the interventional portion well. When you're doing diagnostic, that's your focus. And it's very different. It's intellectually, cognitively very challenging. You might feel like you're there for eight, 10 hours, but those are intense hours because you're gonna, you're gonna have contact points with 40, 50, 60 patients, right? Those are succinct clinical questions that they're expecting you to answer. And you will not take that lightly. So it might be a chest x-ray or an abdominal x-ray that takes you 10 seconds of brain power process, but you're thinking about the question you're answering it. You're doing that, you know, 50, 60, 70 times a day. You have time to recover from that when you're on diagnostic. On interventional, those hours are longer, but the, the minute to minute intensity, I would argue is lower in the sense that you have to, you know, you're talking to patients, you're talking to referring colleagues, you're talking to your team, nurses, techs, you're doing more hands-on work, longer hours, less intensity. So it's very different and they're both essential. Um, ultimately, when you graduate, you'll find the job that works for you. There are no geographic restrictions in terms of what kind of job you can have. So you, for example, if you decide to stay in Denver and you want what we want, which is we want a relatively high intensity setting where we get to use our skills, help a lot of different kinds of patients with a range of complexities. We chose this job because we love it. We're willing to put in the hours that come with it. If you're, if what you want is what Eric is going to do, which is he's going to work out in, a, in an efficient setting, how to help patients in the OBL. Well, his, he's going to work the other pieces. He's going to work on the business side of things and make care as efficient and safe as possible for patients not in the hospital, right? So his hours are probably gonna be much more reasonable, but he's looking at a different patient population. Both of us can work in Denver. Right? So I just want you to know that there are no restrictions ultimately on what you choose to do. It's gonna be up to you what you wanna do in the long term. There's no getting around the necessary devotion to the craft, which takes four or five, six years. Um, a lot of the more clinic-based specialties where you work on the shift work style, uh, you know, work-life balance, if you are procedural, almost all of these come with some emergent component, and you also have to put in the hours, you know, 10,000 hours to be a master at something, you have to do that. Yeah, so just uh, to address the, the uh, text question, which is, uh, would you mind explaining how often you have patient contact or consultation and, and what they're typically like? So 
Um, so as an interventional radiologist, you know, every day we have direct patient contact. Uh, and that, that depends on the complexity of the procedure that we're doing. So if we're doing something complicated, like a, like we said, like a transarterial chemoembolization or a transarterial yttrium therapy or a big complicated ablation and bone cementation, those patients we often see in clinic. So we see, we have clinic just like, you know, your, your regular, um, you know, many other clinicians uh, have. So we have, I have a half day clinic every two weeks where I see complicated patients. Uh, I talk to them about their procedures and we, we basically see them in an outpatient setting. Um, when the procedures that you're going to be doing are not quite as complicated, say a biopsy or something that's fairly straightforward, uh, we will see and meet those patients on the same day of the procedure, talk to them about their procedure, and then, then you know, carry them through the procedure as well. So we really have, we really have the best of both worlds. So we have some of those, those procedures that it's kind of a one-off where we go in, we do the biopsy, it's done, or we do a central line, or we do a permanent catheter, or we do dialysis access work. It's kind of a one-off. And that's, that's really nice because um, you get the satisfaction of doing a procedure and then, you know, you don't have as much responsibility for long-term follow-up, but many of my patients are chronic patients. So um, if you're doing liver-directed therapy and you're treating a liver cancer, you obviously are responsible to follow that. You have to evaluate that, your treatment response to therapy, whether the patient needs more treatment, and that comes with additional clinic visits, phone calls, those sorts of things. So it's nice because you get both sides of, of kind of the both sides of the coin, you get the short procedures where, you know, it's not as much long-term patient care, and you also get the nice, you know, bigger, more complicated cases where you have longitudinal patient care, and it's really, really rewarding. So, you know, the, uh, similar to in Bob's talk, he, he talked about a slide where the interventional radiologist was not mentioned in, in three or four different news articles uh, in a row. They talked to some other surgeon or some other doctor. That happened to me literally last week. Um, a patient of mine uh, who I treated for her liver cancer actually made it to transplant later, and they did a, a big news story in ABC News about her because she was one of the first people in the country to get a hepatitis C positive liver as a transplant. It was cured afterwards. Big long article, national news, no mention of our, real, our of our of our relationship in patient care. That being said. Uh, I talked to her and I, I said, hey, do you mind if I share your story on social media? Because it's, you know, it's obviously nice for patients to hear that sort of thing. And I included from her a, a personal patient letter to me, which said about how impactful we were in her personal care because we treated her when she had cancer before all the really good stuff happened to her. And we were really instrumental in, in getting her to a state at which she could be transplanted. So you really get both sides of the coin when it comes to patient care, um, you know, longitudinal care as well as acute patient care. And it's, it's rewarding from, I think, both aspects. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, you can. Yeah, so the question was, uh, can we discuss the role of APPs in our practice? And then um, I'll invite any of the other faculty or residents come up and yeah. Yes. Yeah. If you want to come up uh, to the mic there, Eric. So the APPs, and we've got both PAs and nurse practitioners, are very crucial to our practice. Um, they help us with continuity of care within the hospital, meaning that if we're in a procedure or whatnot, um, or even if our trainees are busy, they can go upstairs and see patients. Um, when our trainees rotate off service, sometimes that produces a discontinuity in care, but because we have our nurse practitioners and our physician assistants that are always there, we have that continuity. In terms of clinic, each of us have an APP with us in clinic, and again, that helps with continuity in terms of typically, you know, if we're in a procedure and a patient wants to get a hold of us, I tell them to call my nurse practitioner or my PA because I may not be available. They're going to be available and they can always reach that person who can in turn get a hold of me or ask me questions. So it's a really essential part of our practice. And I've been in a practice where we didn't have them. And now that we do, and we can't even think of going 
back to a place where we didn't have them. So um, they are, are indispensable in our practice. I think it has to be one of the, um, I think it has to be one of the most uh, satisfying jobs for an NP or PA doing it in interventional radiology because the other thing I've noticed that NPs and PAs get in interventional radiology is significant autonomy in terms of procedural ability and what they can do. And so for us, chest ports, paras, lines, thoras, NPs and PAs are getting to do numerous procedures at any given day. Um, and I think that they really like that because, at least for me, for any job, I, what keeps me interested is having a mix of different things that I can do, not only procedurally, but clinically as well, you know, talking to patients. Um, and also on that front, I think that, you know, with the NPs and PAs we work with, it is not a hierarchical thing at all. We are all just part of the same team. Um, they actually work very closely with us to do clinic consultation visits, new inpatient visits. Um, I would say on a daily basis as a fellow, I am in continuous communication with the NPs and PAs, and that's the way that it runs most smoothly. Yeah, they, they participate in all levels of patient care for us, um, from inpatient triage to clinic visits with us to doing procedures independently uh, of us. You know, we're there to supervise and to uh, and if they need us, but um, you know, oftentimes it comes in where a patient comes in specifically requests for a, a an MD to do a procedure, and you know, oftentimes I'm having the conversation with them saying, you know, my physician assistant does way more ports than I do. You know, they're the they're the best ones really to do this procedure. You know, because they have they have, you know they have a, a ton of experience in that sort of stuff. So um, it's nice because they their diversity is very is very good and it very much mimics what what we do because we. They see our clinic patients with us. They um, they do their own procedures and they they participate in inpatient care as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So the, the question was, is, um, you know, so IR is a very diverse field and, and within interventional radiology, there are many subsets of procedures and, and are we further subspecializing you know, within that? And I would say that, that we do, although it's not in form, not in title, it's very much in form. So, you know, if you didn't, if you didn't get this sense earlier, you know, for, for certain types of procedures, uh, each one of us you know, as an attending will be kind of the point person for those sorts of things. So if we get a consultation for something like a nerve ablation, usually the, the, you know, whoever has triaged that call will come to me and say, Hey, you know, Dr. Schramm, I got this patient. I'm not sure exactly what we can do with them, but will you take a look? Similarly for things like, you know, complicated vascular problems, Dr. Rashan is, is one of the, one of our go-to people for that, for things like um, so, uh, Dr. Trevetti does things like, uh, we didn't talk about this today, but he can actually do work with endoscopes through percutaneous, uh, percutaneous access. And whenever we have questions similar to that, you know, Dr. Trevetti is a point person for that. Um, Dr. Brown here uh, up there is a, is a point person for IO for complex filter retrieval, those sorts of things. Dr. Kondo, when we have renal cell carcinoma that needs ablated, she's a point, point person for that. So within our specialty, you know, there, there's a little bit of subspecialization as well. Although we can all do these procedures, we oftentimes find ourselves, especially in a big academic center where we have complicated patients, sort of subdividing even further, you know, in, in the realm of interventional radiology. Yeah. However, if you think about by a numbers game, if you only did that, then what happens on call? Okay, so, and, and we've thought about that as a practice. If, you know, we 
only had, and sometimes what the, the sub, sub, sub specialization happens to do with numbers in terms of certain procedures that are very complicated, maybe there aren't as many numbers. So if you dilute it amongst eight people, then you don't have a true expert versus if you have a couple people who are the primary people to do that. One, it's easier for your referring physicians and it's easier for that person to gain the expertise. But at the same time, I don't think Dr. Roshan, every time there's a complex vascular case, wants to be the person coming in all the time or, you know, et cetera. So you still need to be able to all cover each other and do those things and have that general expertise because from a logistical standpoint, you're not going to be able to cover call in that situation. You know, fortunately, not all of the high complex things are going to be things that you necessarily are going to have to cover on call. A lot of times you get the patient stabilized and you can deal with it when more people are around. Um, and I think in the private practice world, again, depends on how big of a group you have. In Denver, we have some groups that are 60 or 70, you know, radiologists. So they have enough radiologists that you have a neurosection or a body section or a chest section. But the smaller private practice groups will have people who they all do everything, but they may be fellowship trained in neuro. So again, if something complex happens, they get an in-house consult from that person. It's just not possible from a numbers game to, to do it where everybody only does that small part. So just in terms of fellowships, uh, after you do an interventional radiology residency, I will can speak more for PEDS IR because there is a specialized fellowship for pediatric interventional radiology. It's not ACGME accredited, but it is actually a very, very, very useful year if you decide that that's what you want to do with your career. And there are other fellowships like interventional oncology and other subspecializations. So if you think you want to do it, I mean, your core skills should really still be there through an IRDR residency but I do think that um, the fellowships have a lot of value too. Great, uh, any additional questions you guys have? Yeah. Uh, well, I feel like I'm fielding a lot of questions, but for me, that was very much the case. So I went through first, second, and the beginning of third year of medical school, uh, thinking I was going to be a surgeon. Um, that was 100% my mindset. Um, I got to surgery and did my, uh, my two months in surgery, and I found that uh, for me, I felt like the there was a little bit, and that this may have been a product of where I trained, which is not here, but um, uh, for me, the I couldn't find a happy surgeon. Uh, and that was very disturbing to me uh, as I went through training. And, you know, surgeons, you know, they, they, they have a hard life. Um, but I decided after that, not only in talking to trainees, but also talking to faculty that uh, a surgeon told me, which I think was a valuable piece of advice. He said, if you can do anything but opening someone up and, and doing open surgery, you should do that. Uh, and I think the reason he told me that was because, you know, of the lifestyle of a surgeon. It's um, it's high demand. Uh, it's a very stressful job, uh, and they they have a lot of those that, that demand on them. So, uh, after surgery, I, I after doing my surgical rotations as a medical student, I I I was pretty disheartened. I felt kind of lost because uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. I thought, oh my gosh, I entered medical school thinking I was going to do this thing, and then everybody there seemed very miserable. I don't want that for the rest of my life. So, uh, then I thought, oh. I've done some rotations in ER, I evaluated that, had my entire application set to go for emergency medicine going into my fourth year uh, of uh, medical school because I thought it was cool. They got to do some procedures, they got to do a lot of triage, they had shift work, it was controlled hours. I felt like that was gonna be a reasonable fit for me. Um, I chose to do a radiology rotation because somebody told me it was like one of the easiest rotations you could do as a fourth year. So I wanted some time uh, to, to kind of just like 
relax. Um, I got there, did a first day in diagnostics, thought, oh, this is okay. Um, and then they were telling me about how the interventional radiologist from next door doing procedures, and I hadn't really heard much about IR. So I uh, walked over to the lab, introduced myself, and said, hey, I'm a rotating medical student. We'll be here for a month. And my I said, sure, show up at you know, six o'clock tomorrow. We're gonna, gonna get started. So I showed up, did a full day of IR, asked them if I could stick around for another day. By the end of that day, I asked them if, they, if I could stick around for the remainder of the week. By the end of the week, I said, can I do the rest of my month in IR? Um, I found it was like the personalities in IR are very relaxed as compared to what I've experienced in surgery. Um, my partners will attest to that and you'll get to meet you know, and hang out with some of us today. Uh, you know, the personalities are great. Uh, we're problem solvers. We do procedures, but we also, you know, get to get to participate in clinical care, much like a surgeon. Um, our procedures are much shorter. So if you are okay wearing lead for a shorter period of time, but not being in the operating room for 12 hours, it's, this is a perfect spot for you. So a surgeon might get through two or three surgeries in a day on a call day. We may do, you know, upwards of, you know, 10, 15 cases in a day. So, uh, sometimes lower acuity than, than a big open surgery, but sometimes complicated as well. So you get a nice varied mix of things. So I'll tell you from my perspective as someone who wanted to be a surgeon when I was in your shoes to now being an attending interventional radiologist, I couldn't imagine a specialty and any other specialty that I would do. I mean, I still love coming to work every day and the hours don't bug me and all that. And I chose to work at an academic center where the hours are generally a little longer than not. So. Yeah, definitely want some um, resident perspectives on that as well. Uh, and I'll also pose the question about internships, what internship most of you have done in terms of the, the residency. <clears throat> Just uh, 30 seconds, uh, similar to uh, what Chris said, when I was in fellowship, uh, we were doing a um, traumatic uh, aortic uh, a transection case where patient was in a trauma. And we actually still do those here at, at Denver Health. But there was a thoracic surgeon who came by when we were doing the procedure and he said, I never thought I'd see the day that I would be standing out here and watching a patient being treated. Um, and to this day, 10 years later, we, as I said earlier, we have the sickest patients who are too sick for surgery and where our multidisciplinary team, who, uh, which is comprised of surgeons, they are actually sitting outside the suite. They're with their patient, but we are actually doing the procedure and saving this patient. So it goes hand in hand. And I initially wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon, but what actually uh, drew me was the fluoroscopy. Uh, another thing is whenever I compare what we do to surgery, we're not surgeons, but we do up to 50 cases, or we have up to 50 cases on our board. And that's spread out between four, uh, a team of four or four to eight uh, physicians. We don't have much downtime, as uh, Chris talked about, 12 hours, we're working day, uh, every single um, time. But and we don't have that much downtime in between cases, yet we help each other out, give us each other breaks, but we're constantly doing multiple procedures that are within our scope of practice in terms of our niche and also outside. Yeah, so when I, even growing up, I had wanted to be a brain surgeon, which I don't know how I chose that when I was young, but for probably about the first two and a half years of med school, that's really the path that I was going down. Uh, and it was about the time that I got into clinical rotations, um, getting to know a lot of the surgery residents, the neurosurgery residents, without naming where I'm from too much, but none of them made it through residency with the same spouse they started with um, almost ever. And they advertised that and they were all chain smoking because they were all stressed and tired all the time, um, which wasn't exactly what I was looking for in my life. Uh, at my med school, they did a lot of the neurointerventional, the neurosurgeons did, and that's kind of where I found out about the field. And that led to uh, general interventional radiology, and I realized how much you can do, uh, and the variety is what really attracted me. Everybody was a lot happier uh, in interventional, and the teams worked together a lot better, the interventional radiologist and the tech and the nurse. Everybody is just a lot friendlier, um, knows each other very well. It's kind of like a family in a lot of ways. 
um, that and when you get done with residency, Eric kind of alluded to this, but you can choose a career that really can span from nearly 100% IR doing a lot of very high end stuff in an academic center, or you can go out into the community and do 75% IR or less. And uh, you get some time with diagnostic radiology, which sometimes you get tired of walking around with lead. Um, it wears on you a little bit. And you can choose a job that has more or less vacation or more or less call. There's a lot of flexibility in choosing what your priorities are and whether you really wanna focus on your career or have a career that can help you really develop a good family life. You know, anything's really possible, but everybody from the academic center down is generally pretty happy and easygoing. And uh, that's really what pulled me in from surgery because I realized that for me, career is not literally everything. I think uh, everybody here at some point wanted to be a surgeon, um, me included, I'm one of the second year IR residents, but I remember um, going through medical school and I had set myself up to do orthopedic surgery. And um, the one thing I kept asking myself was that I want to do the same thing every single day. And I think that's kind of what ends up happening when you do a subspecialty surgery. So one thing I'd, I'd like to pose to any medical student considering doing surgery is why? Why do you want to do surgery? And if it's for um, patient interaction, for working with your hands, for uh, really helping patients get through difficult times, I think uh, surgery certainly has a role to play in that, but I think IR has an even better role to play in that in the sense that I remember as a third year medical student, you know, I was sitting in the IR reading room, um, or the IR workroom where I was at for med school. And, you know, in surgery, there's a certain hierarchy where the attending working in the university hospital doing all of the hepatobiliary cases is, is the top player in the hospital. Um, when he comes into the IR workroom and is asking for your assistance uh, because of something that went wrong in one of his cases or her cases, um, I think that really turned me on to IR, feeling like I could be somebody who could really help the patients once the person who tried to help them couldn't. Another situation was when we had a patient when I was a medical student, and this was like actually the case that got me interested in IR. I was on general surgery, the patient got shot, had an X lab. They couldn't stop the bleeding, but they brought him into IR, and I had, I had no idea what IR was at the time. And within 10 minutes, Granted, this guy was really fast. This procedure was really fast. They had stopped the bleeding from the right hepatic artery. So I think if you want a career where you're helping patients and with a lot less complications while working with your hands, while still doing something that's incredibly intricate, I mean, yeah, we're dealing with catheters and it may not be as intricate as tying a, you know, a two millimeter vessel off or whatever it may be. But what we do is very intricate and we put a lot of thought into how we place our catheters. We put a lot of thought in how we're doing things so we don't damage anything in the patient. I think IR is certainly the field for you. And then I think Dr. Roshan, you posed the question about what internship would be a good thing to do. Um, I wanted to go ahead and just answer that since I'm up here, since I'm walking with a boot and I'd prefer not to walk up here again. But um, uh, I did a transitional year for my own reasons. I think I worked, I worked really hard in medical school and I needed a little bit of time uh, to myself. So I did a transitional year and I think I'm doing just fine in, in residency. Um, my attendings may think otherwise, but I think I'm doing okay. Um, I think now that I'm looking at it and seeing some of my colleagues who have done surgical intern years, I think that they have a step up in the sense that they understand the surgery and they understand uh, certain things that I had to learn while in radiology. I don't think it's absolutely necessary to do a surgical year. There are certain programs who require you to do that. That's a different story. But if you have the option, I think you need to look at what you want. One of the things that I wanted when I finished my intern year is I still wanted to have a little bit of what, what made me a doctor. I wanted to be able to 
look at, you know, if my grandma came in and she's having a specific thing, I could still triage what she had going on. If somebody came up to me and had a doctor question, I could still answer that. And I felt like that's what a transitional year could have offered me. Um, so it's really based on what you want. I think there's pros and cons to everything. All transitional years are all different. Um, some are more surgical, some are more medicine-based, some give you a big flexibility. I think ideally the best way to do it would be to do a transitional year with additional months of surgery. That way you have a wide spectrum of understanding of things that are not just surgical based. So uh, that's all I have to say. I think everybody here has their own varying opinion on that, but that's just what I feel like is most appropriate given what I've heard from my colleagues. So I had a different background going into IR. I was a pediatrician before, so I finished a peds residency, was on my way into a neonatology fellowship and kind of changed direction. And um, I think it served me well to do peds IR at least because I had a good clinical background with kids. Um, and I, I think, you know, if you consider doing peds somewhere in your future, having a couple of peds rotations somewhere in your internship year would be helpful. So just to kind of keep that in the background. And then also um, your question about surgery in particular, my dad was a surgeon. And um, when I was going through med school, one of the things he would always tell me was just do something else, just don't do surgery. <laughs> so, um, and it's not that he didn't love his field or anything, but I think, you know, he looked back at things and he saw when my sister and I were growing up, and my brother, you know, he just didn't see us as much as he wanted to. And, and that was his choice and his lifestyle at that time. And that was how the field was at that time. So, um, you know, always pursue the thing you love, but that was always his advice to me was just, you know, like, this is a really, you know, tough field as far as your home. So, just something to think about. Hey, everyone, uh, Sam here. Uh, so, one, I think, particularly interesting thing about interventional radiology is being a complete physician. So many of the other subspecialties and specialties require imaging, and that requires us to interpret their imaging. Um, but here, you know, we can read our own images and fix the pathology that we're seeing. And I think that's kind of unique um, in, you know, you know, what I'm describing as like the complete physician from the diagnosis to the management. And much like everybody else, I also thought I was going to be a surgeon. And uh, in fact, I uh, was first uh, introduced to Dr. Roshan when I was looking for some procedure especially. And uh, I'm in there and I'm wearing this lead suit and I can barely see the catheter on the screen. And I'm like, this is taking too long. And I'm hot and this is, this is still taking too long. Uh, this is not maximally invasive. I can't see anything. So I, I strayed away. <laughs> It wasn't his, uh, you know, uh, technical problem. It's just, uh, it was just too long for me. Um, and so I straight away, and I, you know, I also considered the surgery urology. Um, and I came back to it for the same reasons uh, that many of my colleagues had uh, discussed. And that was, you know, that they were constantly, you know, uh, you know unhappy. The training wasn't as, as collegial. Um, and so I found that uh, in radiology to be you know, quite uh, refreshing. And so here I am trying to trying to be uh, one of these IR docs. Um, real quick, I'm yet another one of these. Wanted to be a surgeon, decided there was something better. It took me until April of my fourth year to figure that out. I'm a real slow learner, apparently. Um, but I kind of wanted to address this intern year question a little bit more fully. Um, I did a county-based surgical intern year, and I think it was one of the more brutal ones that I've, I've heard that folks have had. I will argue that it made a significant, it gave me a significant leg up coming into this because not only in in interventional radiology, but broadly in diagnostic radiology, a lot of the the diagnoses that you're making are on more of a gross sort of scale. Um, and those sorts of diagnoses and problems and things that you're treating are typically handled, are a lot of times handled either by surgery or complications from surgery. 
Whereas things like looking at the different types of medical renal disease and those sorts of things, that is not something that is typically an imaging diagnosis, but instead a pathologic diagnosis. Um, when you're looking at your intern years, as you guys go out and, and start considering these, consider the context of them. Not only whether it's gonna be internal medicine, transitional year or surgery, but whether you're going to a larger academic center, whether you're going to a county-based program or whether you're going to a small community hospital, because those, the setting of the hospital will make just as much, if not more of a difference in the, the sort of lifestyle that you're going to have, the cases you're going to see, and the level of autonomy that you're gonna get compared to you know, what, which of these three specialties you pick. None of these differences are insurmountable, but generally speaking, when you go to a large academic center, you're gonna be a part of a large treatment team and you're usually going to be the one who's going to be fielding a lot of the calls, taking care of a lot of the paperwork. That's going to be kind of your job as the intern. When you go to a community-based thing, a lot of times there won't be a lot of other trainees. And as such, you can get a bit more hands-on. But the level of acuity is going to be lower a lot of times. And the level of case complexity is going to be lower. When you go to a county-based program, so here this would be like going over to Denver Health, um, Generally speaking, these are understaffed and overworked hospitals, and you are seeing all breaths of pathology from these, and oftentimes are struggling to get the right resources and manpower to make the things happen for the patient. And in that case, you also get a lot of autonomy kind of throughout the spectrum. So that would be kind of my sales pitch for it. Even if it's difficult, it can be very rewarding and you get some really good experience out of it. And if you choose the right intern year, a lot of times they'll let you work in some IR or time on vascular surgery so that you come in with some additional skills too. So. Um, and then last uh, page of that, so uh, unlike everybody else, so you're seeing everybody comes from like a different walk. I actually did a medicine uh, intern year. Uh, and speaking to which I did a, uh, a community medicine year uh, where I did six months of critical care and six months of elective, which was really nice because I got to spend a lot of time taking care of very sick patients, which is what we do in interventional radiology because they're generally too sick for other procedures um, while getting comfortable with things like central venous access and things that are kind of the bread and butter of what we do. Um, then I had enough time to kind of explore other things. So I did a research month in radiology. I did uh, in a time, two months in anesthesia. I did, you know, other things that would help kind of round out my experience a little bit, and polish, polish what I had. So um, comes from all all walks. And then we had one more, I think, question. I think. Take it away. <laughs> if you can have something that is not medically related to talk to somebody about, that makes a world of difference in them remembering who you are and you standing out as a unique individual. At the point that you're coming to the match and they have decided to interview you, they have decided already that you are competent enough to make it through the training program, that they think that you're going to be trainable, okay? What's going to make you stand out as a individual is going to be other things. So for example, things that I talked about and a lot of people found interesting about my applications were the fact that I was a machinist and did plastic injection molding before this, something entirely different from medicine. Or speaking about some of, in context, especially with Rubenstein, who is our, our old uh, program director here, I happen to have done quite a bit of neuroradiology research and he found that very fascinating. Um, but something specific to you, that would be what I would stress. And something that's not just, oh, I'd like to work with my hands. I guarantee you almost every single application that comes out says, I really wanted, you know, I, I, I always like to build things when I was young, or I like to take apart a vacuum cleaner, and I just want a job where I can work with my hands and also solve problems. Be different. That would be my suggestion. Yeah, I would, uh, uh, absolutely second that. Um, he's hit it right on the head, Luke did. Um, you definitely want to talk about something else besides medicine. My thing was um, I was very interested in, in art as a kid. Not, not I wasn't any good at it or um, I couldn't draw anything, but um, I had a lot of experiences. You know, I, my parents would force me to go to museums and I was always ingrained in my mind. So 
I kind of connected that back to radiology and that was what my personal statement was on and I got asked only questions about that. So um, I 100% agree with Luke. Uh, I'm Andre, one of the first year IRD residents. Um, I completely agree with what they said. By the time you make it to these interviews, they've already screened you as far as academically, clinically, do they think you'd be able to fit in with the program? Um, and I just want to see if you're someone that fits into their culture at their institution. So are you someone, especially in radiology, that they could sit in a dark, quiet room with for hours and hours and hours um, and actually enjoy that experience and get something out of it? Um, that being said, I didn't have any like spectacular hobbies or experiences. I like, did a semester of glass blowing in college and hadn't done it since. Uh, and you know, all these sort of little things. But sometimes it's those little things that help you draw those connections. And really, they just want to see that you're passionate about something. So whether that's academic or clinically focused, whether you volunteer in some capacity, whether or not it's related to medicine or have a leadership experience outside of medicine um, or in a different specialty even, they just want to see that you're involved in something and then can talk passionately about that. All right, well, uh, after getting shot down by Audrey, uh, I was basically gonna say exactly what she said, essentially. <laughs> so now you know it's not a mystery. Um, but I think the most important thing in the interview process, I think Luke brought this up, when they accept you for an interview, they've already looked at your scores, they've looked at your grades, they've looked at your accomplishments. They know from that standpoint that you're someone that they'd want there. And I think the reason why I still came up here is because I think it's an important point that hearing it from multiple people it's really good to know that when you go into those interviews, just show that you're a person, you're a normal person, uh, you're not a robot. That's probably the most important thing, seriously. Because uh, I did a transitional year and uh, the program had me interview applicants. And I do remember so many times just hearing the same mumbo jumbo over and over again from people. And I did not remember a single name of any of those people. But anyone that just came in and talked to me about a movie they watched, recently or their interest in a college football team or that they like to go fishing with their dad like just little things that'll kind of trigger their memory that's going to help you a ton it doesn't seem like it but it will that's pretty much it I stepped over to the back um, something that I think is worth addressing is that everybody here has said that assuming you make the interview, and I remember one of the anxiety inducing parts is getting to the point where you do get that. To the application, I think the most important things that people really look for, um, two of them is one that you've shown that you have an interest in interventional radiology. It's kind of one thing for somebody to decide they want to do it, which is great, but have you rotated with them or at least shadowed with IR, uh, you know, research or not, um, showing that you've actually made an attempt to get to know what the field is, you know, being here is great. Um, before you kind of make a jump, it's a big commitment, it's six years. So uh, you certainly don't want to go in blind. It's kind of to everyone's benefit there. Uh, the other thing is letters of recommendation, I think are really helpful because those are what show that you're a normal, hardworking person before you show up for the interview. Um, you really want to find people who know you well, whether they're a big name or not. I think someone who can write a very strong letter for you um, that really is willing to stand up to bat and say how they feel positively um, and how great of a worker you are is going to go further than getting a name from, you know, a department head who you kind of shook their hand once and they said they're willing to do it for you. They're not going to be able to say much about your character or who you are beyond your CV. So. Um, I think those two things, my experience, are really the big part to getting to the point where you do get that interview and then you can show off all your cool hobbies, which most people, I think, talk more about the hobbies I put down than any other given single part of my application. Uh, I wanted to echo something that Chris said here. I mean, it's really important to show that you have a background in IR. Um, one question I get asked a lot is by medical students is, uh, well, do I need IR research? Um, I think a lot of people I know, especially you know, the attendings know that a lot of people have explored other surgical fields and people find IR late. 
um, and that's not uncommon. And I, I didn't have any published IR research. I had done all my research in orthopedics, but my orthopedics mentor wrote me a really strong letter uh, saying sent, he was really upset that I didn't want to do orthopedics at the end of the day. So he wrote me a strong letter um, for my IR, applic IR application. I think that went a long way. Um, and then the other thing is, so basically, yeah, so if you, if you do IR early, if you know you want to do IR early, getting, getting into IR research is great. If you don't have that and you decide to do it later, the thing that could really work for you is showing that you have an interest in it, showing that you understand what a six-year residency is going to be like, and having, being able to have a strong discussion or having a convincing discussion with your interviewer as to why you want to do IR. Um, I mean, I remember I got interviewed, uh, when I got interviewed somewhere, they asked me, one of the attendings drew two lines on a piece of paper and then drew a little squiggle in it. He said, this is an artery and this is a clot. Please design a device that will break up this clot for me. Had I not been in a bunch of cases before that and done a couple of IR rotations before that, I would have had no idea how to answer that question. That wasn't here at this institution. It was way more relaxed here. But um, I think those are two really important things to have. This question really made me do a lot of introspection up there and realize I, some, I sometimes wonder how I got in because I didn't really have a great hobby or whatever. So don't bank on your hobbies. Um, you do need an IR specifically, radiology is a little different, but for IR, do have that kind of um, firm understanding of what the field is. Yeah, uh, great, what can we do? Yeah, so speaking as someone who served as a uh, chief resident here at, at CU, uh, helped select DR residents as part of that, uh, and then now I'm an IR faculty helping select, you know, IR DR residents. Uh, now, um, I kind of, you know, to echo all these guys, I think two things are important. One, that you've uh, fully evaluated your specialty, because it is a big decision, as Kinoz was saying, have an understanding of what IR does. And that's hard, because it used to be you'd get a whole – diagnostic radiology residency to kind of sort that out. Now you don't have that. Now you have to make that decision in medical school with a new IRDR program. So trying to take your time to, to really suss that, that interest out is, is really important. And it goes for a lot of the kind of smaller surgical specialties. I know I can parallel it in my medical school experience to urology where it was like a two week elective and then you got to make a decision like, hey, do I want to do this for the rest of my life based on you know 10 days worth of doing this? Um, and that's really tough. So I would encourage you guys to take your first year or take your second year or take any, you're not going to have a ton of downtime in your third year, but if you have time in your third year or have flexibility in your third year, take time to evaluate the subspecialty by, by, by doing, you know, a dedicated rotation in it. Um, and then secondly, kind of echoing what, what everybody else uh, has said, you know, hobbies, interests. And then for me, you know, coming from like a blue collar area of the country, I always look at hey, what kind of jobs does this person worked in their past too? So like, you know, I find folks like, you know, when I talk to like Luke, who was a machinist for a while, you know, I think a lot of those things, if, if you've had a real job before uh, and you know what it's like to be out in the work, workforce, you understand what it takes to work on a team and, and, and you know, commit to something and, and do it well. I think that goes a long way in interventional radiology because that's kind of our approach to things. Um, and I, I always find that stuff to be, you know, to be worthwhile to kind of, to kind of ask folks too. So that's something I, I kind of personally look for, but everybody's going to have, you know, every attending that's going to interview is going to have different weighted stuff, you know? So if you're interviewing with Dr. Ryu as, as opposed to me, he may say, ah, I really want to, you know, delve into what this person's researched. So it's going to, you got to sort of play your audience a little bit. And some of that comes out in the interview when they start asking you questions and just kind of trying to, trying to tease out what they're, you know, what they're trying to ask you about. So everybody's going to be a little bit different once they tell you, but by and large, yeah, trying to be, trying to have a little bit of research, trying to, trying to make sure that you've sussed out the field, uh, as you know, as I was saying, and, and prior work experience, I think are always good things to have. So, um, any other questions uh, before we get you guys upstairs? All right, sweet. Well, I want to take the opportunity since we're probably going to split into groups for you guys to get, you know, actually hands on on stuff. Um, we're probably going to split into smaller groups. So I want to take the opportunity to thank you guys for coming out. I know you guys just had a test, you know, yesterday, you know, finishing up, up those sorts of things. Probably really tough to come in. Um, I know for me, when I was in medical school, I'd like slept half the day on Saturday after, after like our test week. So I would not have been here. So I, I appreciate you guys, you know, taking the time and effort to, to do that. Um, 
And I think as far as the specialty goes, I think it, it, it serves as a um, you know, kind of a, an example of how kind of close knit we are as a family here at CUIR because we have a, a ton of residents and, and fellows who come out, taking time out of their own personal schedule. None of these people that you're seeing on your, on your left are, you know, have to be here today. They all decided to show up to, to kind of represent the specialty for you guys. So, um, so I think that's kind of, if, if that's something you want to sign up for, you know, I think this is a, gr a, a great specialty for you. So um, without further, you know, delay in the day, we're going to get you guys up. we got a couple of stations that we're going to have you guys deploy some coils, do some kind of aneurysm coiling. We'll have you do some, uh, do some bone work uh, with me. We'll have um, uh, an IBC filter station where you get to deploy and retrieve IBC filters. And then we're going to have a, a little biopsy station as well, where you can do ultrasound guided, you know, needle placement and things like that. So, um, if you guys want to, you guys can follow me upstairs and we'll all kind of ride the e-elevators up and I'll take you up to the labs.